and I asked him for a line of white. And the bartender and the manager took me back and they pulled out this mirror because they do a lot of it. And it wasn't white. It wasn't quite white. Back then it was crank. So it was this powdery stuff. And it was these big four rails and for huge. And for whatever reason, I was just trying to show off. And so I did a whole one, even though that's not what I would normally do for this. And then when I sat back, they were looking at me like, you might die now. And then like... (laughs) 10 seconds later, the back of my head felt like it had a blowtorch on it. And I was like, oh, my God. What? And uh, the pain lasted for almost a minute. And then they were like, that was way too much for you to do. (laughs) And then I was like, what even was that? And then they were like, crank. And then I just, after that, it was the best thing I'd ever done. It's a drug episode. Who is a lover jacket? Dude, these are the first words that come out of my mouth today. Can you tell? I was sleeping, and then I was not sleeping, and then I started up this podcast recorder, and then I was talking. I think I sound pretty good for first thing in the morning. Meth, you guys. Who doesn't love meth? (laughs) Only people who haven't tried it. It's one of the world's wonder drugs. It cures everything. From sleeping to not scratching, all your ales are going to be cured with methamphetamines. So today, okay, Jessa Reed is a comedian. She was on This Is Not Happening last year. Uh, one of the best stories, by the way. Pro- first, I mean, for sure. I don't want to say best. There's no way it's not top 10. It's probably top five to me. You should, I'll, I'll link to it on ariushafir.com. Um and it's all about meth. The, the story is was entitled Meth P. Uh, fucking, what was it called? Meth P. Yeah. Jesse Reed, Meth P. This is not happening. From oh, a year ago now. So uh, for sure, check that out. Uh, she's hilarious. And she was a meth addict. <laughs> but I mean, for real. Not like I tried it a few times. I mean, like, you remember those ad campaigns? Um in LA, they had them. I don't know if they had them elsewhere. It was I lost me to meth, which was pretty, pretty creative in terms of uh, in terms of the M E being the first two letters of meth, um, and it was just all these people <laughs> with fucking no teeth <laughs> going like it ain't that good. And I was like, dude, is meth an epidemic? Is meth something that like I should be worried about? <laughs> but dude, of course not. Nobody I knew took meth. Um, it's a, it's a trailer trash drug. Heroin is at least has some upscale, like writers vibe to it. But meth is like, I mean, you saw the people that were all cranked on it and breaking bad. Those weren't fucking people you invite to a formal for sure. Not it's, it's fucking Midwest garbage. Oh, speaking of Midwest garbage, I'm going to be in Cleveland this weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, with Adrian Appalucci. She'll be opening for me. And then moving right on to more meth country, Omaha, of Nebraska. May 17th and 18th. Yeah, you guys, I'm visiting meth country in honor of this um, this podcast. May 9th, 10th, and 11th in Cleveland. May 17th and 18th in Omaha. And then I'll be in Columbus, Ohio, May 14th and 15th. May 15th is also Shroomfest. May 15th, 16th, and 17th. It's also Bonnaroo. What a great time to overlap. If you're at Bonnaroo, May 15th or 16th, uh, you want to be doing that. I mean, I guess you could also do it May 13th or 14th, but if you're going to do acid one day and shrooms another day, why not save the shrooms for the 15th? Why not say the truth again? I, I'm pretty sure Fish is playing on the 16th. Uh, that might be a day you want to be doing the mushrooms. Um, or walk around all day on it. It's a good daytime drug when it's warm out. 
It is not a good drug for comedy shows, by the way. I've seen a surprising number of people come to my shows, Joe Rogan shows, on mushrooms. Guys, it's, it's too restrictive an environment. Don't you know this? You don't want to be locked into your seat and made to be quiet when you're on mushrooms. You want to be able to move around. That's why it's a summer drug where you can leave your apartment or your house and go, I'm going to go for a walk now. I'm going to go to the woods. I'm going down to the creek. I'm going down where they're doing the meth, and I'm going to fucking walk past them and laugh. The last thing you want is to be told to shut up and sit in a confined seat. It's just not the right. I know I talk a lot about mushrooms on stage, although not this hour, not Ari Shafir Jew. Um, surprisingly, not talking about mushrooms at all on this hour. Interesting. Um, but regardless, even if I was talking a lot about it, you don't want to be on mushrooms. It's like you don't want to be on mushrooms when you're buying mushrooms. It doesn't go with that experience. You know, not all mushroom experiences require you to be on mushrooms. So, I mean, maybe I get, no, I'll take it back. I'll admit when I'm wrong. If you want to take like a cap or if you've done mushrooms a bunch, a cap and a stem and come to the show, then okay. Not on an empty stomach, then okay. That could work. It might make you laugh a little more, but I don't know. After, after it's done, fucking pop those mushrooms and then go out into the world. When I finish, you know, I say, that's it for me. Fucking pop them in your mouth. Take your picture. If I'm out there for pictures, depending on probably second show. You definitely want to be at the first show on, on, uh, in Cleveland on Thursday. It's, I guess it's tomorrow. When there's only one show, that's when I go longer. Um, yeah, but meth is like a hard, a hard drug. I mean, <laughs> that is definitely not a... Oh, also, I have a couple more dates. Uh, June, May 25th in Cardiff, Wales at Glee. You definitely want to be there. I'll probably be buying drugs from any... I need to... Yeah. Well, hold on. Let me research this real quick. <sighs> okay. Um, the Borgata is pushing off. They're supposed to do the Borgata September 9th in Atlantic City, and they are... Pushing back on my artwork. <laughs> they, they don't. It says Ari Shafir Jew, and it's got to pay. It's the artwork I used for the whole fucking tour. <laughs> I guess they got a lot of Jews. They're afraid of offending. That's what the show is called. Though, what do you want me to do? It's called Ari Shafir Jew. It's it's not my normal. It's not just random stand up. <laughs> what do you want me? To do? I mean, okay, I'll well, figure out. Um, by the way, you guys. Oh, can I just say this? Spoiler alert. Game of Thrones fucking sucks. What the fuck happened to that show? What the fuck? Hollywood. Hey, can you turn this into a more Hollywood-style ending? And every, the first two episodes, they're just them talking. We've waited a year and a half where it's like, let's catch up and do some talking. Let's make sure that you see the characters all having a good time, still enjoying each other's company. Oh, that's important. The White Walkers are coming to kill our humanity. Let's make sure we all have worked out our loose ends for two fucking episodes. I get maybe one scene where a few of them are in there going like, it's been an honor to serve under you, sir. Okay. But it's all fucking talking garbage. And then the one-armed dude... The one hand dude is like, well, I just wanted to fight under you. That's why I'm here. Fucking shut up. And then, but they're like, all right, just wait for the fucking battle of the White Walkers. The battle of, the battle for Winterfell. That's got to be the one. This dude has amassed an army, which is already big. And then he's taken a bunch of people that would have been an ally for the Starks. And instead, now they're fighting for the White Walkers because he invaded them already. Guys should be an epic battle and i get it they're all like we're all gonna lose we're gonna lose we're gonna lose we're gonna lose so of course probably two-thirds or three-quarters of the main characters are gonna die and definitely not none of them who do you have the one fucking cuck who, who's in love with daenerys who can't fucking move on she's too young for you bro you're being a fucking bitch and, and, and a little girl. And then Theon, the fucking dickless wonder who's been gone for a bunch of episodes and it came back late last year. <sighs> he was cool until he got his dick chopped off and then he was a fucking 
garbage character. This is my impression of Theon. They can't do it. I want to help, but I can't. For, for three seasons of that. I want to help, but I can't. I don't know why. I'm a dog. I can't help. Also, by the way, so every time uh, they they have to kill one of the main characters, they go way, way slower. Theon, no, not Theon. Who's the dude who was a fucking cuck for Daenerys? He gets stabbed like fucking s- slowly, like eight times. Everybody else, they fucking chop, 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 chop. When it's a main character, it's like, here's a stabbing. Here's a slow stabbing. The dude who keeps coming back from the Lord of the Light, here's a slow stabbing. We'll let you get all the way to the end and have a nice death. We're not just going to chop the shit out of you like every other character. Here's where it all went south. When they started trying to please fucking, I don't know what. I don't know what. Tying it up in nice loose ends. That was never the show. The show was main characters just died because that's the game of politics or that's the game of war. And then, I guess probably when they moved past the fucking writer, they just... And they had an occasional good episode, but the further away they got, and this season has been garbage. So the little girl, they thought, oh, she's she's an interesting character. The little girl who runs one of the fucking, you know, the lords of whatever. She's kind of a warrior. And I, I get that she'd be like, no, I'm not going into the crypt. I'll, I'll fucking stay up here and fight with my people because I'm their leader. And that makes sense to me. But that also means you're going to die instantly because you're a little girl. And little girls aren't as good at fighting as trained fighting men. And so I get it when she gets swiped out of the way by the giant and goes, Whoa, and fucking probably should have died right there. But let's say she's just broke some bones and then runs to the giant going, oh, by the way, no one else could have been like, oh, and run. If you want to say she used her littleness to, to, to be underneath something with the giant couldn't see and then stabs him in the back of the, in the back of the fucking foot, you know, in the Achilles. Without him seeing, okay, maybe with some dragon glass and he gets shattered instantly. That I could see that, you know, kind of like uh, Pet Cemetery, the first one, where he's like slices that Achilles. Ooh, what a tough scene. First I went to play, first I played with mommy, and then I played with Mr. Johnson, and now I want to play with you, daddy. Now I want to play with you. <laughs> what a good movie that was. It was shitty, actually. Um, so she just runs at him, and instead of just stomping on her, he, I guess he's like, oh, well, this is a recurring character. Who had a couple good lines, so I should, even though I have not seen that, and my orders, my telepathic orders, were to kill everybody. Instead, I'm going to fucking slowly bring her up into eye stabbing range so I can look at what are you talking about? Oh, this one's shorter than other ones. I mean, just so you can say girl power. If anything in this show, if anything, Would have been more realistic for these fucking White Walkers to rape all the women. That also would have been unrealistic because they have orders to kill. They're not like fucking real soldiers. They're just like mindless soldiers of the Night King. And then just so much goes wrong. The Night King falls off his dragon and definitely don't call the dragon back to come pick me up again. And then Theon... Rushes a Night King. Okay, sure, he's there. He's like, all right, I got this fucking brand finally. Who's been gone doing what exactly? Just flying with crows for a little bit? Oh, I, I got to do this important task of flying with crows so I can check the scores. That's all he's doing. He's just checking scores. That's like you at a wedding going like, I got to fucking go to the other room and see what the score of the Bears game is. And I did at my sister's wedding, and she found us, and she said, get back in that wedding right now. It was a playoffs. It was the playoffs. What did you want us to do? (sighs) So then Theon rushes them. Okay, sure, I get that. You got no chance. May as well try. And the Night King just goes, stops it. Okay, he's rushing with a spear. Grabs his spear, shoves it in half, stabs him instantly, and he's dead. In a half second. He's so fucking quick, so fucking strong, the Night King. And then when Arya flies at him from out of no I mean I thought two episodes earlier I really thought that Arya was going to figure out that she could take the face of a white walker 
and then blend in with them, march with them, and get close to them enough to stab them. I thought that's the way, and that would have been badass. And I don't know if they could have smelled her or what, but that would have been a way that was justified in the world they've set up. But no, instead, one of the Night Kings, not the Night King, one of his fucking main henchmen, just his his hair starts moving, so, which means the wind. And he's like, oh, that's weird. There's definitely no wind when I brought a fucking storm all around. There's definitely, couldn't be a wind. It must be something. And so then, if that wind is her flying, that means she's been flying for a good three and a half seconds in the air. Which even Earl the Goat Manigault never stayed up for three and a half seconds. There's a there's a a, a, a story that Earl the Goat Manigault uh, had such a giant vertical leap that somebody pump faked him, drove into the lane, pump faked him, and he jumped up to block the shot. And then what you're supposed to do when you wait to block a shot, when somebody's blocking your shot, you pump fake, they jump up, and then when on their way down, you jump up and take your take your jump shot over them because now they're on their way down, you're on your way up. And somebody pump faked Earl the Goat, Manigault. He jumped up. They waited for him to come down. And before he came down, while he was on his way down, and when they started jumping up to take their shot, they got a three-second call. That's how fucking high he can jump. So what we're saying is Arya Stark can jump, can stay in the air longer than one of the greatest playground basketball players of all time, and he was down by the time the guy took the shot. It was just right before he got the shot off. It was three seconds. She was still head high. She was still, her body was still at the, at the height of the fucking, uh, higher. Her knees were at the fucking, so fucking dumb. And then again, the guy catches her and just, whoa, well, this is the main character. So I guess her death has to be slower. Fucking, you fucking Hollywood writers. Will you follow the fucking blueprint he set up? And he just holds her and then lets her drop his fucking Valerian steel sword and stab him. So no answers given who the fuck he was. What did he want exactly? None of that. Not, how did she get there? How did she get close to him? None of that. Just oh, let's let a, a girl do girl power. Girl power. I think it, I'm entertainment now and I'm a fucking stupid idiot. It's just like they decided, look, she's going to be the one to kill him. Okay, uh, uh, all right. And then, mm, easy peasy. Well, I did get choked a little bit. That was her plan to get stopped and not have her fucking trachea crushed. Not have a second knife with her. It's, it's, it's just, it's hard watching this fucking show. If this was season one, for sure I'd stop watching. You know what I think might happen now? Because this wasn't a possibility before, but now it is a possibility. I think the show might end with a song and dance number. I think they're all going to get together, characters new and old, dead characters and old characters, and even some White Walkers, and they go, this is the game, this is the game of thrones, this is the game of thrones. Oh, wait, was that a show they did in Edinburgh? I never saw it, so if that was the song, I got lucky. This is the game of thrones, who will sit on the iron throne? Well, okay, I'm not great at singing, but that's not probable. It's now a possibility with what they've set up, which maybe that shows how great they are as writers. They've now taken us off all their expectations. And again, in episode four, so who do they kill? A dragon. And then the fucking slave lady who nobody really cared about anyway, side characters, they're just killing side characters. (sighs) It's so fucking dumb. How did she not drown to death, by the way? Her ship was sunk and she was underneath. No, she's a, she's a prisoner and they kill her because they know she's important. And so then, tell me if this doesn't go against everything in the show. So Cersei's been trying to kill the fucking Tyrion forever. She sends, she's tried to kill him herself. He got out. She sent assassins to go kill him, which is assassins like, what? hey, I want a, I want a bigger title. Why, why, did you, why did you have to punch him in the face to ask for a fucking – your whole purpose of this episode was to pay off something you set up last episode. Oh, oh really? You need to kill – okay, but can I get a, a bigger bribe? Okay, great. 
oh, I was the lord of something else, but now I get to be the lord of something bigger. Okay, I'll take that. Thanks. Sorry about the punching for no reason. I showed up and then left. So she wants to kill, and he said, fuck you to the fucking Meister, right? I'm going to go talk to Cersei myself. He walks up to the gate. All the archers are fucking trained on him. She's holding her hand. Maybe I'll fucking put the fire sign down and murder this fucking midget finally. I hated him for when he was dead. He killed my mom. I get all that. I get all that. He for sure killed my dad on purpose. He sided with the enemy. I hate him more than ever now. now. Hold on. Let me hear what he has to say. And he says, stop this. Don't kill the fucking slave lady, Massandra. Don't do it. We can work this out where you can live and your kid can live. Just stop. And her answer is, kill Massandra. It's, an, it's, it's the final act of war. We're going to fucking war. Slice her head off, which is her saying no to the terms, and we are now at war. Um, why not also kill Tyrion? He's right there. You're now at war with these people, and you've hated them. Why not? Go ahead. I got your message. Thank you. Your services are no longer needed. Archers, fire away. Murder the shit out of this midget. Put so many fucking arrows in him that you can't even see him anymore. He's all arrow. And then I'm going to bring him back as a fucking, like, the mountain. None of that. Just, okay, I guess let him go. This show fucking sucks. You fucking Hollywood writers. What happened to you? Is it just you taking notes from this, from the network? I don't know, but you fucking suck. It's hard to watch now. Well, you know something else that's hard? Your cock. Guys, I'm almost done. Your cock. Your, oh, I missed a fucking show. I missed a show. Guys, I am putting on a show. The first ever show at the new Stan Comedy Club and Restaurant in New York. The first one ever. I'm putting on a storytelling show. Ari Shafir's renamed storytelling show presents Dawn of a New Era, May 23rd. The stand is finally opening again. 116 East 16th Street, right next to Union Square. It's opening up again, and I'm putting on the first show. You want to be a part of it. I don't even know if the rest of the kitchen is going to be open. The bar will be open. Enough for you to drink. Um, it's stories about new beginnings, springtime, births, called the dawn of a new era. And it's all stories about new things and rebirths and stuff like that. Uh, it's going to be a great show. I already booked two of the best storytellers from This Is Not Happening. It won't be Joey Diaz, just so you know. Um, so it'll be two of your favorites. It, it's going to be at least, and I'm booking the rest of it now, but it's going to be a great fucking show. Um, Definitely be there for the first ever show at the stand. How fun. How exciting. They're finally back in business. Um, tickets are available at ariashafir.com, as is tickets are available for Cleveland this weekend, Omaha next weekend, uh, Columbus in June, Glee in June, um, the Brigada maybe in September, <laughs> if they could prove my artwork. How are they going to say it's fucking Ari Shafir Jew without saying Jew? Um, and what else? I think that's it. Oh, no, no, no. Indianapolis, uh, July 31st, and Milwaukee, August 4th. Um, those are all the dates. Uh, okay, so now, speaking of hard, your cock, your rock hard cock, you guys. Blue Chew is sponsoring today's episode. At bluechew.com, um, if you use the promo code Ari, um, you can get a shipment for free. Here's the deal. Here's how Blue Chew works. You chew it, and then your cock gets hard. Um, by the way, they don't just send you one in a shipment. They send you like a bunch of pills. Each envelope has like a bunch of pills. So they're going to send you the first one free if you use the promo code Ari, dot com. Um, and all it does is, and I get it, if it's, it makes your dick hard for sure, but here's what it does better. After you fuck the first time and then you have like a few minutes of conversation, uh, instead of just going right to sleep, after like 20 or 30 minutes, you're like, oh, let's fuck again. You're just hard again. It's pretty great it's pretty great <laughs> instead of having to play the, sh- the shove and push game um you're just fucking hard again it's 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 yeah that's all you do you just fucking chew it and then your fucking dick gets big five dollars shipping that's all you pay for that's less than fucking john jones paid for the over-the-counter fucking fake dick pills he gets a 7-eleven these are legit dick pills Special deal for our listeners. Visit BlueChew.com and get your first shipment free when you use a special promo code Ari. Just pay the $5 shipping. That's fucking great. Um, yeah. 
Anyway, fucking chew up and fucking f- fuck with your rock hard bonus. That's honestly what it does. It just makes you have a hard dick. You guys, let's start the episode. Let's talk about meth for a while. This song is in place of a copyrighted song. Where do you live? Uh, Glendale. Oh, weird. Nobody lives there. I love it. Really? It's so much better than it doesn't feel like LA. There's no traffic. Oh, there's no like Our Hollywood. Our podcast there. studio is in Burbank, so mm-hmm. I don't have to mess with LA. Yeah, that is. I guess they're right. Those cities are like outside of LA enough. Yeah. Where you're like not really in Hollywood. But also inside enough to where 45 minutes and I can be at a meeting, which yeah. is fine. Or go do spots and then come back out. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's okay. I just hate the fuck how how like Hollywood is just like put its roots into everything there. Yeah. Well, that's so I don't like all that. Like yeah. when I decided I had to move there, I didn't I was like I don't like a lot of this and I'm far enough out that I just feel like I live in the suburbs of kids and stuff. Oh yeah, you got kids. Fucking weird. <laughs> with that with that guy? No, uh-uh. Oh, okay. I was married for uh well, I have a 24-year-old. Damn, and what? How old are you? 42. Damn. 18? 17. 17. Fuck. I hadn't even had a kiss yet. That's I was crazy. married. I was married that at was 16. The song. Yeah, that was okay. the pastor's kid. So she has a kid. So I'm a whatever that's called also. Your grandmother? Mm-hmm. What? Yeah. Damn. <laughs> that's like Miss Pat. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of similarities in, in those two Pat. stories. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... I guess she was a grandma at like 32, but like, yeah. or something like that, 36 maybe. People are like, oh, did your daughter have a kid early? She goes, no, 21. No. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, well, then how? Oh, shit. She's like, 13. Like, wow. Oh. Yeah. It's two kids by 15. She's she's crazy. Did you see that thing she did on, a, on Dangerous Comedy? Uh uh-uh. uh. Oh, it's Larry Charles, who I guess did Cheers maybe, or I don't know. Um, he did a, a thing on Netflix called Dangerous Comedy, and it's just like comedy around the world where it's actually like you could be thrown in jail for oh, it shit. and stuff. Yeah. And then it cuts to like some like liberal, like Native American comics here. And like, yeah, no, well, you know, it's tough. There's stereotypes. <laughs> <laughs> like, shut up. <laughs> Fuck off. Go do your jokes, you fucking hacks. They're also like the worst comics. You see their jokes, and like, oh, you're like a three year comic. And because you're big on the res, you think you're like really big. Ugh. Yeah, and then Miss Pat goes on, and she's like, she just glances by getting molested by her uncle, and she's like, she doesn't sit in the pain at all. Yeah. Well, I'm like, yeah, why not? Why why can't that be the the norm? Yeah, that's all I want to do is uh, make people laugh at the saddest, most morbid things that have ever happened to me. Do you see a lot in LA? I mean, I haven't really been there day to day much in the last few years, but like, are you seeing a lot of like clap comedy? <laughs> you know, a lot of what? Clap comedy. I don't uh, go out very much, like oh, unless really? I'm on a show, and then I kind of have the the t- Tim Dillon and I were talking about uh, just rolling in, doing your set, and rolling back out. I don't think I'm. Oh really? Yeah. Oh weird. Um, I have like social anxiety, and I feel like I'm, you know, I don't know. I feel like I'm too old for some of this shit. So. Oh yeah, that could be actually. I can see that. Yeah, I got to the comedy store when I was like just starting, so I was like. I also have social anxiety, but I'm like, yeah. well, those are my, that's my clubhouse, I guess. Yeah. I do go like hang out. I love the patio at the comedy store. So I do end up just like hanging out there because it's like my preferred bar. Yeah. But very little socializing. It's changed so much. That front bar is like nice now. Yeah. Was it not before? No, it wasn't even open most of the times. It was open for like only on Saturday nights. Um, it's just nobody was there. Okay. Yeah. It was like, you know, we'd have like 10 people on a weekday in the show. Yeah, was the improv the hangout spot back improv then? Improv was for sure the hangout. And Laugh Factory a little bit too, but for like different people. But improv was like where all the industry went. Okay. I hate it now, the comedy store. I don't hate it. I just hate that you can see an agent. Like they just dress like agents and like, hey, yeah. bro, how you doing? It's like, yeah. why are you trying? It's like <laughs> you're intentionally trying to talk not like an agent. <laughs> it's like an undercover cop. Yeah, it's like, what, narc? <laughs> Yeah, you can just see it. Like, I don't know you, but like, which, which company do you work for? It was just like, 
Yeah. It's like, you know, when like, a drunk is trying to talk sober? Yeah. <laughs> like, very effectively <laughs> clear. I'm going to the store. <laughs> You're like, all right. Yeah, that's how those agents are. <laughs> they dress like super hip, too. <laughs> They're like, you could tell like some fucking, somebody dressed them. They paid somebody to dress them. Ugh, whatever. <laughs> anyway, that's what I hate about LA. <laughs> they fucking the industry. Ruined the comedy store. Yeah, the Why industry. everyone moves there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, in my LA was the non-industry. No one touched the store. So it was just like, yeah, it was just a place you go. So it was kind of an underground type yeah, it was cool. Scene, and now it's it's Portland. It's Portland. It's the yeah. when the when everyone finds out about the underground, and then it like ruins it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's why I say like Denver and places like that. Like, don't move here. Quit moving here. <laughs> Montana. They're like, don't tell anyone about LA. Don't tell anyone yeah. from LA about Montana. That's what they yeah. say. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they're gonna come and ruin it with their fucking lattes. I grew up in Portland. It's awful now. Really? Yeah. Did you start with Ian Carmel? those people no i was before them and then um i lived in portland and delaware my whole life i would i would fuck my life up in portland real hard and then move to <laughs> delaware and yeah. fix it and then um and then leave delaware because it's delaware and go back to portland and yeah. that was my cycle so i was actually i judged ian carmel in a comedy competition Social situation yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i can't throw stones there um yeah. When he just started, he oh, was really? like six months in and oh. already so good. Oh, was he good already? Yeah. Obviously. He was always good like him real early me. on, but I didn't yeah. know that early. Yeah. It was his first year. It had to have been because I had never heard of him. And then he was in this comedy competition. He won and then he was gone within a couple of years. Do you judge him well? I always feel bad about the people on like said anything like that constructive I miss? criticism yeah. and they're like, fuck you. I'll never forget that. No, he, I think I judged him best. And then there was another guy who had a lot of promise, but was super into Jesus and just fell apart on, um, he got left at a gig by a headliner. Left? Yeah. The like he was just, just getting on the headliner's nerves. And so the headliner ditched him in whatever city. And then it was this big, Portland had some great Facebook wow. dr comedy drama. Mm. I belong to all the Facebook comedy groups that'll let me in. Stand up does that really well. Their infighting is so fantastic. Yeah. And so this was a great, this was a great thing to watch on Facebook, but he quit shortly after that. But I think it's because God told him to. Oh. <laughs> Deion Sanders had someone where he got into God after he quit football and he had some car fixed. And then he was like, no, Jesus told me not to pay this mechanic. <laughs> and he was like serious about it. And the mechanic was like, I mean, be that as it may, I'm going to need remuneration <laughs> for this. Weird. God just told me that about my taxes. Not to do them. How'd you fuck up your life in, Del in uh, Portland? Um, meth. Oh, yeah. Well, the teenage that. marriage. Yeah. And so that marriage was a train wreck. I don't know. Were your parents you for that marriage? That. My mom was a meth addict. Okay. Oh, that's how you got into meth. Yeah. And I had gotten taken out of her custody as a teenager. I kept running away from home and getting picked up by the cops. And she was like down. So she lied and said I hadn't run away. I got locked in a mental hospital, got put in C CSC custody. Wait, that's what she said or that's what happened? Um, I had gotten picked up like way too many times for running away. And the last time I got picked up, I'd like OD'd on some cough medicine. And uh, I'm like 15. <laughs> she covered for me and said I hadn't run away. And so then I got locked in a mental hospital. She was obviously high on drugs. And so they took me out of her custody, put her in, put me in my grandma's custody, who was super into Jesus, who kept taking me to church. So I fucked the pastor's kid. That's when you got into Jesus? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, uh, like nine months later when I got pregnant and we had to get married, I got. I love how there's no... I got pregnant once and my mom was like, Ari, what happened? And I was like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> fucking didn't pull out in time. What do you mean? Like, you know how this works. You've had kids. <laughs> I fucked up. Um, yeah, people forget that, that Portland and Seattle are actually Washington and Oregon. Yeah. And it's not this like hippie, you know, like cool part. Like it's druggy and gross. Yeah, it was. And Portland was just not, it wasn't even weird yet. Oh. Uh, um, this would be like the mid '90s, so it was just Portland. It was just rainy and kind of lame, and yeah. um, it it didn't hit its. I think the late '90s it started to get real cool. It was a fun place to do math for sure. Who got you into like? How did you, did you get it from your mom? Did you take it from her? 
No, I did a gig. By then she was clean. She also got into Jesus. And then I nice. um, I moved to Delaware to get away from that marriage. And then came back, accidentally started doing stand-up, and then was just on the road. Yeah. And would get so... Because I'm 21, and back then they just gave you just unlimited drinks all night for free. There oh, was yeah. no drink tickets. You just drank for free all night. Yeah, you guys ruined it for everybody else. Probably, yeah. Because I was 21, and that was way too much. I was so wasted every single night that I would free be... Free drinks. It's crazy yeah. not so. How could you not? Yeah. Yeah. Plus, I had a joke about it being my birthday. I opened with saying it was my birthday and what I drank, and so I would just have a stool for, full of vodka, uh, cranberry. you shit up. Way too drunk. So I started getting pulled over the next day. on, And these were like triple runs, you know. So these were like eight-hour drives to the yeah. next show. Oh, wow. And so I had gotten pulled over and um, almost got a DUI at 10 o'clock in the morning. And someone told me that if you do a little bit of coke, you will be sober enough to not have a hangover. Which is just like my kind of life hack, right? So I was like, yeah. <laughs> That resonates. And I'd already, I was 21, so I'd already finished my Coke phase. Um, I've actually heard that it's like if you got to drive home from a bar, just do a little Coke and you're like, yeah. okay, you can get home. No, it's crazy. It instantly sobers you up and you literally will not have any symptoms of drinking. You think that's real drinking. or just imaginary? Could be imaginary. Okay. But like they all swear by it. I swear by I mean, I swear by it, but that doesn't mean it's not placebo. Festival coffee. That's what they call cocaine. Yeah, if you, do, you can't do too much because you get high. Right. But if you do just a little bit, you won't have any of it. You won't have the nausea, headache, nothing the uh, next day. So, I, but then I did crank. I was in I was in Montana. Yeah. And I asked him for a line of white, and the bartender and the manager took me back and they pulled out this mirror because they do a lot of it and it wasn't white. It wasn't quite white back then. It was crank, so it was yeah. this powdery stuff, and it was these big four rails and for huge and for whatever reason i was just trying to show off and so i did a whole one even though that's not what i would normally do for this and then when i sat back they were looking at me like you might die now and then like <laughs> 10 seconds later the back of my head felt like it had a blowtorch on it and i was like oh my god what and uh the pain lasted for almost a minute and then they were like that was way too much for you to do <laughs> and then i was like what even was that and then they were like crank and then I just, after that, it was the best thing I'd ever done. It was the most... Crank? Like, yeah. What is crank? Just meth. Like, so they, they make the chemicals illegal, so they keep having to change the formula of oh. what is now meth. Yeah, they do that for when they try to, like, get, like, um, um, army people to pass the weed test. So they, like, change it slightly and make spice. Yeah. Which is just way more dangerous, but it doesn't show up yep. exactly right yep. in, in tests. So, so it's probably changing now, because it's ephedrine. You can't get ephedrine. And it used to be propylene, I they called it prop dope. Ephedrine was the cough syrup stuff. Mm -hmm. It's and, a, and that's what people get to make crack and to make meth. Yeah. Oh. So it's ephedrine, uh, um, red phosphorus, and iodine are the main ingredients of meth. Iodine. But meth was just crank was switching over to meth when I started. What do you mean switching over? Whatever they made crank with was becoming impossible to get. They had made the chemicals illegal, and so somebody came up with a new formula to make speed. Oh, and that's so, meth. And that's meth. Oh, how much is meth? It's cheaper now, I think I've heard, but it's like um, like a half teener, which is like a point seven five, was fifty bucks. And how long did that last you? When you first start, that would last you a couple, a few days, probably. Oh, Depends okay. on how you do it. If you smoke it, you'll go through it in a day because you just smoke all day. You just keep going and going and going. Yeah. Meth is weird. Every way that you do it has a completely different effect. Really? Yeah. Is that like heroin too or different than heroin? Heroin, I don't know that much about. Have you done I heroin? I think most, no. Oh. Oddly enough, my mom taught me like a realistic drug education as a kid. So like I knew that there was a difference between weed and opiates. And this That's is like smart. what I teach my kids because when you tell your kids that all drugs are the same, That's what I got they told. inevitably try weed or psychedelics and then they think that you're full of shit and then right. they eat pills and then now your kid might end up being a junkie. Where my mom was like, weed is fine. Yeah. Psychedelics are fine. Uh, these things are a life sentence. These, these things are Russian roulette. You do crack, you do heroin, you do speed, you do meth. You're crack, meth, and heroin are like the big three. Yeah. Speed is like one step down to me. 
just because it's in Molly sometimes, so it's like it doesn't have that, yeah. that same attitude. I consider Molly a psychedelic, don't you? What? I consider Molly in the psychedelic. Oh, maybe. Any club drugs, ketamine, club dr- fun drugs, GHB, yeah. Drugs. Any of those are like yeah, uh, fine. I yeah. consider them fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think weed's medicine. I don't like it, but I, I think weed's Berlin medicine. I was in Berlin at a nightclub, and, and me and this, my promoter, or my whatever it was, uh, I forget what his job even was, but like we went to try to find drugs, and we were just like looking in the bathrooms where you're supposed to like ask people. We couldn't find anybody, and then finally I found somebody. He goes, no, no, I'm, I'm not doing any. It was it was ecstasy or, or, or Molly. I don't know. I think maybe just ecstasy, so a mixture of stuff. And he goes, no, no, I'm, I'm leaving at 3 a.m. because I got my kids. <laughs> um, thing tomorrow. I got I got to fly home in the morning, uh, and I was like, okay, so then I'll just throw this out. I'll just throw this XC away. Because all right, give me some XC. <laughs> I love drug addicts. You can, like threaten them with the loss of drug. Um, wait, okay, so fifty bucks to snort it for three days. Um, so I started out snorting it. And then I started smoking it. Smoking it, you go through it the fastest. Yeah. And it's the worst high. But it's is it like really? very you get addicted to the smoke, which is very similar to vape. There's something weirdly triggering when people vape around me that I'm like, that's the kind of clouds you would get. So I think you're really addicted to that. Oh. It also super dehydrates you and most tweakers don't know to drink water. So then you end up just kind of in this useless daze where you uh, do everything in circles and get nothing done. Shooting up is the most efficient. Um, yeah. So shooting up, I think you could 20 bucks a day. 20 bucks a day. A day. And a you're day. high all day? Pretty much. Oh, that's great. That's a good bargain. It's a good, it's uh, efficient. That's what I try to tell people about mushrooms when they're like, this guy's trying to rob me. I'm like, dude, either way, it's six hours for the price of like three beers or five beers. Yep, like exactly. It, it's like, it's, you're super cheap either way. Yeah. Let him rob you a little. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. So meth is way cheaper than Coke. Which is how a lot of people get high or get hooked on meth from, from coke, coke, and they can't afford it. That's what they do with like pain pills too. Yeah, and they, well, that's they, yeah, that's the it, heroin epidemic heroin. is yeah. is is fucking pain pills. Um, and then meth, your body doesn't break it down. Your body metabolizes coke. That's why it doesn't last very long. Is it knows what to do with it, so it just breaks it down into other things. So you're only high that long, but your body doesn't do that with meth. So it just keeps running around your system. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow! And then you just pee out straight meth. Really? Mm-hmm. What do you? What do you mean? Oh, it's just like like when you it shit It goes in broccoli. meth and comes out meth. Do people drink their piss? Yeah. Wow. Wait, hold on. Okay, so that is the um that's the story I ended up to- Well, so I read the article in Time oh, yeah, yeah, at yeah. one Sorry. point I that <laughs> yeah. uh I read an article in Time talking about the meth epidemic and talking about how people get hooked because it lasts longer and then it explained the science of why it lasted longer. And I was like, wait, so we're peeing out meth. Yeah. And so I told everyone around me, like, listen, no, read this article. We're peeing out meth. And the internet wasn't that great back then. Google was still like edge, like on- everyone didn't know about it. Remember, do you remember when Google was like only the cool kids knew about yeah, it? Live leak and, um, and, um, info seek things like that. Yeah. Like it was like, it was, everyone was still on uh internet explorer. You had to mm-hmm. like understand the internet. And so I looked into it and there was no, uh, there was one article about, um, bikers getting caught with barrels of pee and they didn't know why. And I was like, dude, if the bikers have it, it, you can make piss. And so I, nobody was on board with me. I could not wow. talk anybody into this. I said so many great ideas that nobody got into, but so I try to turn it back into, meth i tried to like i just like collected piss and tried to My manufacture water purifier. i try i like i knew how to make meth kind of you know and so i just did the things you do with regular meth i think uh i didn't stay in high school long enough to really understand basic chemistry so i'm just like well i know you put meth in a, in a pressure cooker let's just put the pee in the pressure cooker. <laughs> <laughs> um so i was not successful i did eventually try drinking piss and it had a completely it i got very high yeah it's like psychedelic though really Mm -hmm. i like that and so that was the end that was close to the end of me getting high wait it was like my finale was that a wake-up call or was that just towards the end it was just towards the end i think i had started the the government had really made it impossible to get the good chemicals so we were getting this like imported cut up meth um so i started to come down in general i think i stopped shooting up and started just like eating it 
and then and then the pee thing, and then just kind of got bored. How do you it. when you shoot up meth? What do you do? You grind it up and add water. Mm-hmm. And grind it up and add water, the... and then pull it back. And then I didn't have veins. Do you heat it up like the spoon thing? No, you don't have to do that. Okay. So it just instantly breaks down into water. Oh, okay. It's it's much easier than heroin. I think heroin you have to do that because it doesn't want to break down. Do you have to mix it up like an emergency, or does it just it just goes in? Just goes right in. Okay. And uh, if it's good, if it's cut up, it'll take the cut will take a long time to melt. So they cut it with um, uh, what's that MSM, that like um, supplement that bodybuilders use. Uh huh. They cut it with that because it looks just like that, and that stuff will smoke clean. And so this is a crystal meth education. Yeah. Um. So I had to shoot up in my neck. Really? Because I don't have veins. I've never had veins. Like since I was like fourteen, I had to get my appendix out, and they they couldn't. Look how small those are. This is the uh, yeah. biggest they've ever been because I like work out sometimes now. But um, so I had to shoot up in my neck, which someone else has to do. Because you can't see it. Yeah, I can't. I'm not someone that can like do things backwards in a mirror. Try to do it in the mirror, and then you like go yeah. the other way. <laughs> so you have to hold your breath and like press down into your throat so they can do it. And then, uh, like sometimes if they took too long, I would take a breath and then it would get all messed up. Sometimes oh. they would accidentally hit an artery, which is you don't get high; your head just catches on fire. When you shoot it in there. Mm-hmm. Wow. But then that's a whole thing like that. You get addicted to that rush. And then the high is just like maintenance. Like you just are, you're high functioning. What do you mean the rush? Um, when you shoot it up, you get this, this instant like rush. Yeah. It's like that with every drug. Yeah. So they all have their different things that you get addicted to, but then you end up chasing that rush yeah, with, the, with the shooting up. And it's like um, the first 20 seconds. And, but the amount of damage that my body sustained trying to accomplish just that 20 seconds eventually i was like this is stupid because it would like i would have to it would like miss and just be in my neck Uh and i learned that native americans would use tobacco to pull poison out from venomous bites and so i would put wet tobacco on my neck and uh, it would pull it out i never got any of those it worked yeah I love how everybody in every drug is chasing the hot, the first high of the day. Yeah. And then also ch- chasing your first high that you've ever done. So yeah. Like the first time you smoke weed, you're like, you're always trying to get back to that. Now, I never, um, I got way drunk. higher throughout. They say with heroin, you get high the first time and you never get that again. That wasn't true with meth at all, but also meth doesn't make you, heroin's gross. Heroin's gross. Heroin's so gross. I know it's weird to be judgmental about. <laughs> seem, like, just as dirty to me as each other, but yeah. Heroin's gross in that it makes you sick. Like you're actually suffering sick without it. Oh uh, yeah. It just is such a a prison. I mean, I guess meth you would just fall asleep. I would be sitting at a bus stop and just be like, okay, too much time has passed. I have to take a nap now, and really? like can't even get on the bus. I just have to sleep for five hours. <laughs> But I'm not vomiting. Dude, so, okay. So when you see those tweakers out there in New York, just kind of like bent over, is that meth? No, that's heroin. That's heroin. I don't think I've ever seen a tweaker in New York. Wait, wait what's a tweaker? Is that a meth? So the thing? tweakers are the ones like vacuuming their lawns oh. and, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. Does meth give you energy? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I don't understand a drug that you want to go to sleep. Yeah. I mean, they're way different, right? Yeah. No, yeah. meth was like... Uh, Everything was so interesting and fun and there were, you would get into like projects, you get high and then you would just like take your stuff apart and then like put it back together wrong or just, you could steal anything. Stealing anything was fun. You could steal trash and it was fun and you could stay up for days and have hallucinations with your friends. Whoa. And it Stealing was- trash. <laughs> <laughs> it was way more fun and we see junkies every once in a while we'd hang out with them not quite the same vibe but they would just like get high and pass out and then there was a lot of throwing up and yeah yeah it was like the flu were you there all the time or was it like stuff where you see people talking to themselves and like was it that or was that also heroin uh talking to yourself is probably meth okay um heroin they just basically sleep yeah a uh, meth trigger psychosis for a lot of people and i thought meth was interesting i in that whatever was going on inside of that person the stuff that people hide the stuff that people keep behind a mask Mm -hmm. you can't hide on meth and so if you are a piece of shit it will be obvious in the way that you tweak 
What do you mean? So people who like hate themselves, they will just pick their face. They'll just sit in a mirror and just pick their face for Whoa. days. Yeah. People who can't, um, people who can't, uh, function. There are other people who just get high and then just like jerk off, like just can't stop jerking <laughs> off. Um, <laughs> What a great side effect. There were, yeah, I think meth would take you, I'd call it newfound cluck syndrome. Meth would take you what? to your deaths. Cluck, clucking is what they call it when, um, do you ever see the people doing like, I don't know how to do what? it on a podcast where their body is like contorting. What do you mean? Show me. I'm um, like, oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that's meth. Really? Yeah. It makes you look kind of like your like your inner retard is trying to come out. Yeah, well, yeah, like you you got your hip bone on one side of the house and your your ribs on the other side of the house. A lot of that's dehydration. I don't know why tweakers don't realize they should drink some water. It's but... no education. That's a problem. Yeah. I feel like telling parents like your kids are going to drink. Teach them how to coast. Yeah. Teach them water drink, water <laughs> drink, water drink. Yeah. So just te- like gonna get drunk. Yeah. It's the denial. It's the same thing with like sex education when we were kids and stuff. Oh, yeah. It's like right. they're going to do it. So you're just right. setting them up to get hurt and because you're Christians. just in this denial. Yeah. yeah and all the exactly. Christians are like, no, if you give them condoms, they'll use them. It's like, okay, you can't fully deny that, that it's possible, a small yeah. percentage. But then, like, most of them are just going to use condoms when they would have already been fucking without. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You're not preventing them from, well, the whole just idea of giving them permission. But I think people ask me all the time about, um, cause I have a 24 year old daughter and a 16 year old stepson. And the way that I taught them about drugs is very similar to how my mom taught me about drugs. And people are like, well, then your kids are going to smoke pot. And I'm like, well, you're an idiot if you think that your kids aren't going to smoke pot, <laughs> right, but right. like, if they're going to smoke pot, they're going to smoke pot. But at least my kids know that there's a difference between weed and a Percocet. Yeah. My mom was always like drugs, the umbrella of drugs. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, I got into it way later, so it didn't matter. I was already an adult, but like. Yeah, then people, you're right. People don't know. And they're just like, you're a liar. I yeah. tried this weed. It did nothing. Give me that yeah. meth. Exactly. It's because um, I am afraid of opiates. Opiates are the things I'm uh, most afraid of. What, like Xanax and Vicodin and shit like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the pills. Because the pills lead to, you know, I know a lot of junkies and it starts with pills. Yeah, plus pills, like you need to take more and more and more. Mm-hmm. So you're going to end up being like on a 30 pill Soma a day habit just to fall asleep and you're like fuck yeah i know a lot of people who weren't who don't have like the addiction gene or whatever you know they don't they don't um they didn't have any symptoms of addiction when they were young they get in a car accident in their 30s yeah they get addicted to the pills because you get sick without them and then there comes a point where the doctor cuts them off or they can't afford the pills anymore and now they're shooting heroin damn yeah that's what so what was your line how'd you get into from what to what so the the when meth talk about weed being a gateway drug. Like, what's your gateway? That was it. Was just the doing the meth at the. Um, so I smoked weed. That's I was allowed then, to smoke yeah, weed. Yeah, but you're already doing a bunch of coke. I did coke for like six months in my twenty when I was twenty. Yeah, I went through a coke phase, and which then, means you're already drinking and smoking weed. Yeah. I quit. So I smoked weed and drank as a teenager until I got saved, until I got into into Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. I got pregnant, I guess, is when I stopped. And I was allowed to smoke weed at my mom's house. And I wasn't allowed to drink. And I did shit tons of acid. Instead of going to high school, I just did acid every single day, which probably explains a lot about me as a person. But high school is way more fun that way. Yeah. And also not going to classes made it way more fun. fun. Yeah. 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 And so that's how I got my GED. And, um, then I was clean for like five years. I didn't do anything. And then I was just drinking a lot, but I'm 21. I'm on the road. And, um, I had done Coke for like a summer, but I just picked up on the fact that like, okay, I get paid on Friday. I buy Coke and then I buy more Coke and more Coke and more Coke and more Coke. And then I spend all my money and then it sucks going to sleep. And then I feel like shit the next day and I feel guilty all week because I don't have any money. So yeah. it didn't take me long to realize like, oh, this is never going to turn out any different than Not this. Not sustainable. And so I just quit and it was like fine. Oh, really? It was, yeah. it was easy? Yeah. You were just like, okay. Yep. Oh. But I was drinking a lot. And you got then- to replace. But I'm like, tw- but I'm 21. It's pretty standard. Plus, you can bounce back from anything at 21. Yeah, exactly. And it was also just a lifestyle, like road road comedy and um, 
you know, that's just what we did. And then it's like those ASU girls who are like, how are you in such good shape? Like, well, I try to only eat Denny's three times a week yeah. instead of five. <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> you're like, how? It's just, their, it's just that age. Because I'm body's 20. Back. I yeah. can do whatever I want. The, um, the Coke I was doing to counteract the alcohol, I really, it was easy to just do a tiny bump because I didn't care about the high. Like, I didn't want to get high. Yeah. And then the, the very first time I did that speed, I was like, that crank, I was like, this is all I will do from now on. And by the time I got home from that run, I had already decided that I was going to do meth for the rest of my life. Really? Yeah, it was really good. Um, I think I, ar- I already had like severe ADHD. And um, every time they ever tried to put me on meds for it, I was like, but I could get so much money for these. And so I never actually took it. Yeah. So I do think that there was just a part of me that like finally I was going the same speed as the rest of the planet. And so it just something about that. I was like, oh, this it felt like a homesickness I'd had my entire life was gone. And so I just total life pivot, quit doing comedy after hallucinating a... It's like a crawdad tarantula uh, scorpion walked up on the stage while I was just bombing. Bombing because I'd been high on ecstasy for a couple days and was just eating a dick in Walla Walla, Washington. And then got startled by this thing walking on the floor and then stared at it for way too long. Way long while you're in front of people. And then realized that I was in front of a hundred people who were already like, I was saying my jokes, but without any delivery, like no inflection, just like, just if you just say the words, I was so fucked up. Yeah. And then I realized that I'm on stage and just kind of stare at the audience for a second. And then I cried and ran off the stage and the, uh, was it caught out real? No. It wasn't there. No. Damn, really? Yeah. I mean, because I would have been safe if everyone would have saw it, but it was definitely hallucinated. And I stared at it long enough to realize that I was hallucinating and then just kind of like, I hadn't slept in days. It had to have been four or five days. Jesus. Yeah, because when you first start doing it, it wasn't like that at the end, but when you first start doing it, it fucks you up like that. Like you stay up for days. But I'd also done ecstasy and shit, which is like, you need to sleep Mm -hmm. after that. Sleep and shit. And so I ran in the bathroom, I locked myself in the bathroom, and then the bar owner comes in and is like, you can have your money or the hotel, but like you didn't earn both. And like, I didn't earn either. (laughs) It was so bad. Um, I mean, that's almost, I I rarely take a side of club owners, but that's like, yeah. Yeah. I hired you to do something. You didn't do it. Yeah. Why would I pay you? There's no way I finished my time. Right. Because I, once I started crying, I was like, I should just go. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it was also my first time bombing i had never bo- like i shouldn't have even so i um had lied and told some co-workers that i did stand up and um because i had been like going and watching an open mic in portland this is before everyone and their fucking mom was doing open mics and so i had been going to stand up and then was funny one night at a work party this is how i started comedy and everyone was like, oh, my God, you're so funny. And I was like, yeah, well, I do stand up, which is a, a lie. lie. <laughs> and then so five days later, they're like, oh, my God, we're all coming tonight to watch you do stand up. Because like a like a true non-comic, I was like, I do stand up at Burbati's Pan on Monday nights. Yeah. So they were all coming that night. So I had to do stand up. Open mic. Yeah. So yeah. I went to the open mic that I already went to all the time to watch. And as I'm signing up, they're like, I didn't know you did stand up. Shh, shh, shh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shh, quiet. And then I crush. Really? Weirdly, yeah. And then what? I think, so at this point, I'm 21, but I've been married for five years. So I'm like funny for the young people because I'm young and a flail, but then also can I have jokes about domesticated life and stuff. And there was, this is like 98, 99. There just wasn't women comment you know there were most shows were dudes and um i don't know how i did i was hammered i was so drunk and so afterwards a guy came up and was like we need a woman for this comedy competition on friday so my third time on stage because i did another open mic was uh, the preliminaries and i made it to the next round my sixth time i did the semifinals and made it to the next round and my ninth time on stage i won this comedy competition i beat all the local uh comics 
and it, there was a bunch of paid work was the prize. And so I was a professional comedian my 10th time on stage. Damn. That's and then, crazy. Yeah. That's I went from having crazy. no aspirations to being a stand-up to being a professional stand-up in less than a month. Wow. And, of a lie. Yeah. <laughs> what a good drug addict way to get into things. Damn. That's a... And then I was like a slut with a car. Because my husband left me over that. He was like, no wife of mine is going to do comedy. Like Miss Maisel. I haven't watched that yet. Is that what happens? Yeah, the, 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 the boyfriend or husband finds out she's doing it and he gets like really pissed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was like, no wife of mine is going to be doing stand-up. And I was like, deal. Also, it's like, <laughs> but why? He didn't want me in hotel rooms with dudes. Well, you're not in the rooms. With yeah, them. you get your own room. He didn't want me traveling around with dudes. He's like, "You're not a comed- You're not a comedian. You're a wife and a mother." And I was like, "Well, well, you can be both." Or yeah, did both. I can be a comedian and a mother. Yeah. Bye. This marriage <laughs> sucks. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I love when people are like I'm putting my foot down. I'm like yeah. on something I'm already thinking of leaving. Yeah. <laughs> like, this, you're not in a good negotiating place, <laughs> yeah. man. I wouldn't exactly. do this. It did not go how he thought it would go because I was like, "Cool, you want to keep the cat." <laughs> So then, um, then I was just like slutty with a car. So all the headliners would take me with them yeah. and cover my time. Cause I had like 10. <laughs> oh, I love that. People understand like early on you get work because you have a car. Yeah. People are like, Hey, you want to open it? And you're like, Oh, that's really cool. I'd love to. I'm like, yeah, sure. Hey, I don't have a car. Can you drive? Like, of course, yeah. for sure I can drive. Thank you so much for inviting me. And you don't realize a way later, like oh, that's the only reason you're inviting yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. Somebody told you that Jess has a car. Yep. And so they're like, yeah, let's keep inviting her. Yeah. I really thought I was like an up-and-coming star. And it's like, no, you just had that Mazda 626. Yeah. Um, so I was on the road a lot. I Two or three weeks of the month. I wow. I was out doing these. Uh, That's great. Yeah. What a great learning environment. Yeah. And I was featuring. So I just like built up my half hour as quick as possible. And then I did that for like nine months. And then I discovered uh, Crank, and then I quit within a couple months. Was the Walla Walla incident? And then the next day, I was so de- I was so delusional that I called the the Booker and was like, "I, it's time, it's time for me to take a sabbatical to write a book." <laughs> <laughs> I love how no. grand everybody is in show business. <laughs> it's, it can never just be like, "Hey, I gotta quit for a while." It's like. Yeah make it even better that's why if you ever see those apologies people make almost all of them are still trying to like push themselves higher yeah they're like I- i've grown i'm a better person now we all need to grow and that's what i've done i've grown so it's almost like so wait you're taking this thing where you did something shitty yeah and you're trying to make yourself seem like a hero yeah instead of just like not a villain it's crazy how pompous everybody is in this fucking business I've, got, I've evolved. I've evolved. And how great it is that I've evolved. I hope you all can too and get to my level. It's like, so we're only knowing you because you wrote the N-word in some tweets. And now you're saying you're better than us who never used them. All right. Great. That makes sense. Thanks for gracing us with your... Yeah. Oh, yeah. I well, time off now to write after a book. I've done this Red Lion tour and uh, all these <laughs> casinos in Hoquam, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm ready now to write my book. The world is ready. Did you ever read it? No, no I was high. Not. Yeah, I made some collage art. Um, what does meth feel like? Like, t- sort of try to describe it for me. You've done soup. You've probably done ecstasy that feels pretty close to. Have you done a lot of ecstasy? Yeah, yeah. Do you remember back when ecstasy was like pressed pills? When did you mm-hmm. start? Did you pressed start pills, late? The like, yeah. and the yeah, yeah. So that's two thousand one. Pretty close. If you take uh, the 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 roll part out, but all of the speed aspect of it, I love the speed. Is speed yeah. meth? Is that the same thing? No. Those press pills had a lot of meth in them. Oh, or had something similar. Yeah, to people that. got mad at, at at ecstasy. They're like, it's better now that it's Molly because it's now it's just pure MDMA, and now that's all cut too. But like, but like they're like, this is going back to what ecstasy used to be, which is just the MDMA. Yeah. But like, like when, when I was, was taking that? I had the speed and they're like, I don't like the speed. I'm like, I love the speed. I loved the speed. Yeah, you're dancing all night. Yeah. Just Molly's good feelings. And you just want to cuddle. But like. Yeah. Molly. I, Cause I, then I was just, I was sober for a long time and now I do, um, psychedelics and stuff again. Yeah. And the, 
the shit this these days. I'm like, I couldn't dance on this. I can't get out of this fucking bed. This is like fun yeah. to stare at this lights on my ceiling, but like yeah. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. I mean, it's probably best that it doesn't have speed in it, but So what? It's just the feel like what's the inner feeling? And it's different with different batches, but mm-hmm. it's a little bit of a, a rolly body high. And you are just super focused with a ton of energy, but usually you would have to, you have to have like the clearest mind to actually do anything with that energy. Otherwise it's a lot of like, Oh, I'm going to go. You could never get anywhere that you're supposed to be. Like people would always miss their probation appointments and shit because you would try to leave the house and you'd be like, Oh, I can't leave the house until I get my shoes on. Oh, I can't get my shoes on until I change the laces. Oh, I can't change the laces till I wash these laces. Like I can oh, yeah. you do that like backwards thing, you know, in a circle and not actually accomplish anything. And so. you don't even wash the laces. You don't do anything. No, you just go back and back and back and then you're like, I need to go through this box of photos real quick and is that anything like um, when you take those concentration pills when you don't need them? Yeah. So you've taken like Adderall and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, Adderall is so. pretty similar to, to meth from what I've heard. Okay. Yeah. I remember if taking those. If you abuse them, if you like, take a big amount of them. Yeah. To clean my apartment. Yeah. And then going like, oh, no, I got to rearrange. Yeah. Yes. That's that's meth in a, in the, in a nutshell. Oh, okay. Is a bunch of, I would just get high and then just rifle through stuff. And I'm going to do this, and then I get distracted, I'm going to do this, and yeah. I get distracted, I'm going to do this. And next thing, you know, it's eight hours later, and I've accomplished nothing, but I've been very busy accomplishing nothing. What about the emotional feeling? Is it like, I can take on the world, I, I'm great, I'm terrible? There is some take on the world. It does, it causes uh, very strong sexual feelings. And very strong, like there was a lot of violence. I witnessed a lot of violence. I endured a lot of violence. Oh, what do you mean? People um, punch each other? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I saw a lot of aw- like awful, violent things happen. Um, but my relationships were all very violent. It, all the pictures that are left of me on meth, I have various like black eyes and, and lumps on my head from getting a propane tank thrown at my face while trying to stab my boyfriend. And, oh. you know, um, is it violent? Because like when kids are violent, it's because they're like they think they're right. And yeah, they don't know the line and they always feel justified in their violence. So it's like, that's my toy. You took it. I'm going to grab your arm and squeeze it because like I'm right to do this. Did yeah, like you're that? just like going a million miles an hour and everything is so amplified that your emotions are so amplified. So when you get angry, it's not just angry. It's it's this Super. crazy force behind it. And you're also not sleeping and eating. So you're not rational, but you can't tell that you're not rational because because meth is like no one. You don't get sick. Yeah, I did not have a cold for six six years. Whoa! I get the, I get every cold that comes around me, and I you don't get sick if you get a cold because you haven't had any meth. You just do some more meth, and it's gone. It's cleared up. Yeah, I don't know if that's all the Sudafed or what, but it, oh yeah, meth would kill. It's like kill everything in its path. If you left meth on a spoon, it would just slowly eat the spoon. Whoa! It has like lye in it, which is what you put in a bathtub if you want to get rid of a body. <laughs> So it's probably not like good for you. Although I did, um, at 39, we got life insurance and they do this crazy blood test when you get life insurance that tests your organs and everything else. I don't know why we don't all just get this every year, but, um, when they gave us the quote, they were like, it's going to be more money than this probably because once the blood test comes back, it's always worse than you think it is. And, and so, um, It'll go up. And then when the guy came back, he was like, your premium went down. You are the first person I have ever seen rate higher than the quote. Uh, You are in perfect health. And I was like, that's hilarious. I shot meth for six years. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) I think because I don't drink because I didn't like I drank for like a year of my life. And I think alcohol is the real. What kind of violence was attached to it? Like what, 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 what happened with you? Shooting, stabbing. Oh, to me. Um, mostly like domestic violence with boyfriends. I did one time. That's boyfriends. Mm-hmm. Okay. I did have a guy get his head bagged and stomped in my front yard. Bagged is they put a bag over his head to catch the the, uh, the air, the blood, and the 
whatever. Oh, oh, not like a plastic bag where you can't breathe. Yeah, plastic bag around his head and then uh, got his head kicked in. What? Um, Death? He didn't die. I never saw him again. I don't, I think he was brain damaged or. Damn. Or, and they catch um, him. Bless his blood. And then, like, there was blood all over the drugs. You know, he had drugs in his pocket. We pulled the drugs out of his pocket and then just, like, put acetone on it and still did the drugs. <laughs> so gross. <laughs> I mean, there's almost nothing that you're like, it's got some blood on it, but I'll still do it. Yeah, there's just, I didn't have like a death wish, but there is, you're also, we're in our early 20s, so you already think you are invincible. Mm -hmm. Um, At one point, because I had like a near-death experience in 2000, um, Yeah, and then I was just nuts after that. And so I like went back to a big ball of light that told me that I was, um, that reality is a video game. And that uh, the just the Earth is just where we play, and that we've been playing for you know we were the dinosaurs and everything else. And then I just like communicated with aliens for the next few years. So I was like on a completely different trip from the drugs than everyone else. I, there is something called meth induced schizophrenia. So I don't know. It was either um, either we are playing a video game and I got I got hip to a bunch of shit, or I had schizophrenia. Damn. Um. So I was like around all of this like crime and violence, but I was on, I was on this like spiritual awakening. What trip. like uh, is this like um, simulation theory kind of stuff? Kind of, yeah. They just it was like now I would describe it as virtual reality. So they just said that we that this big vibrating blue ball of light is is what we are and there was this like homesickness that i describe feeling my entire life just dropped off here and i remember being a little kid and changing with my with the lights out because i always thought the stars were an audience mm. and Make so yeah and i was being watched Damn. when the truman show came out i was like yeah that's <laughs> what my life has always felt like and so i'm in this i die uh i don't know uh what I have a couple of theories of what from, but, um, and while you I'm in, will die or you died. I did die. I, uh, foamed at the mouth, pissed myself, passed out in a dance club and, um, from drugs. You think? No, I think there were a couple other things going on, but I, there's a possibility GHB. I don't remember taking GHB, but it was everywhere. We did. I used to drink that shit straight out of the water bottle On purpose, right? Yeah, but it, I, it, the whole reputation of GHB was it's just gonna get you date raped. And then as I grew up and got into comedy, I found so many people were like, no, no, you take it yourself. Yeah, no, I did. I did so much GHB that yeah. like I can't. If somebody dosed me, I don't think it would have affected me. But <sighs> um, meth doesn't do this to you. I know that. So I'm in this blue ball of light. I don't have a body. I, but I'm still myself, but I'm a part of this blue ball of light. And for the first time ever, that homesickness that I have felt my whole life and could never put my finger on was gone. And I was like, oh, this is what I'm from. I'm from this blue. vibrating blue thing. And um, and then I just communicated with me, but without words. And like I could I could feel my brain translating it to words when I woke up. And it said, you did what you went to do. You learned what you went to learn. You can go, uh, you can stay here if you want, or if you want to go back, there's something cool you can do. And, um, uh, in that moment I knew that, that death was optional or it felt like death was optional. I was like, Oh, we just get to decide to come back if we want. What the fuck am I afraid of? So I came back without a fear of death, but I came back and became very suicidal because I was like, why did I go back? Like that b- blue ball of light was bliss, like was maximum hard. bliss. The best drug you've ever done. Just this rolling, vibrating, perfect outside of all pain and suffering. And then I fucking came back. And when I came back, I had to live my entire life to get to the present moment, which is what I guess people are describing as your life flashing before your eyes. You to catch up. Yeah, I didn't live it. So I always picture that as like a film strip or like yeah. a linear f- thing. But it was, I was a baby. I was, I lived my entire life to the present moment in like fast forward. So when I woke up, I'm sucking my thumb because I was a baby five seconds ago. Oh. And then I have a real weird interaction with the doctor uh, who was like mad at me. And um, I leave the hospital and I'm like, I know, I saw God. I saw God and it's me. It's us. We're God. There is no, because at that point I believed I was a backslidden Christian 
And you were what? A backslidden Christian, which is like when you decided to sin rather than stay with God. Like I believed the, I still believed yeah. in the Christian God. I just thought I'm, you were bad. I want to fucking do drugs too bad. And then after that, I didn't. I was just like, we're God. We, we were making it up. And then I um, start getting communicated with by aliens. And so I was maybe higher than everyone else. I don't know. So for like f- the next four years, I just kicked it with otherworldly beings and learned a bunch of stuff that is uh, supposedly how to beat this game <coughs> and the nature of the game and everything else. This is nobody was talking about reality being assimilation. This is 2000. Yeah. This was, um, so now the fact that it's in the collective consciousness and people are talking about it all the time and other stuff that the aliens told me, like that, um, the games change with the, like a shift of the ages and that the game that we were in was a fear-based game, um, with all of these parameters that are made up and dichotomies that are made up like right, wrong, light, darkness, male, female. And they're like, none of these actually exist. These are all just things you created to play out the game. And so male and female not existing was like, what? And they said that that would dissolve as we move into a different game. That's like eight, eight dimensions and, uh, way more things you can do moving things with your mind, um, levitating, uh, uh, there will be no fear, no death, no disease, no male and female, no right and wrong, no light and dark, no yin and yang. Everything's one and you can do whatever you want. Everyone knows they're playing a game. So this is all like I was on board with, but none of it made any sense to me. And then years go by. I get my shit together. I'm living a regular life. I write this off as like schizophrenia, whatever. Yeah. And then people start talking about gender being a construct (laughs) and in a couple of years an entire generation starts to uh or in a couple of years a generation starts to like erasing that line in a very short period of time and religion dies a, a a pretty quick death for as long as it rained yeah it goes from like the center focused everything to like fuck you idiot yeah yeah. Yeah. I mean, the pendulum has definitely swung way over into into atheism, but yeah. and then so many people start talking about reality being a simulation. To where when I said this stuff fifteen years ago, eighteen years ago, you know, people are like, ah, "What the fuck are you talking about?" Yeah. And now there's some movie coming out where it's like a Sims type movie. Really. But one of the characters becomes aware that he's in a that he's in a video game. Oh, God damn it. There goes everything I ever wrote. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, well, it's, it's everywhere now. Yeah. All of the, all of the movies and stuff have this. Well, Matrix 2 kind of started a lot of it off. Was huge, yeah. yeah. And that was supposed to be a big awakening. Well, we were moving towards, uh, according to the aliens, we were moving towards this big kind of mass awakening and then 9-11 happened and, uh, and then is. Slowed it down? Yeah hard to escape a fear-based reality when you get triggered into um mass fear and then again the the crash yeah i feel like if you look at stuff over time over Mm -hmm. like you know hundreds of years but like sped up you'll see like little blips yeah and in the moment it looks like well now we're like after um fucking what's her name michael jackson's sister had her tit come out yeah and everyone's like fcc's like going hard no one's allowed to curse pretty much And you're like, oh, no, but it's just a quick blip. And now we're allowed to do whatever we want. We have podcasts. We can say and do whatever we want. But, like, at the time, we're like, this might be the new reality. But, like, from the 50s to now, it's a straight line down to to creative freedom. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's just that little quick blip. I had hoped um, not uh, not to bring Trump up, but I had kind of hoped that um, how off the walls – awful uh the stuff he says is would at least get us to a place where can we have a president that cusses like can we can we live in a fucking real reality yeah um can we get rid of this like obviously fake ass facade we know this isn't what you are behind closed doors can we have some authenticity this guy's bananas but like now that we've had a pussy that's talked about grabbing a pussy can the next president just be a little more 
real, but it doesn't look like I met some Argentinians once and um and they were talking it was right after Trump got elected and so we we're just talking about it a little bit, but I wasn't around so I wasn't really seeing like what, what the reaction was to him taking office. Yeah. You know, and um not after he got elected, after he got into office. And um and they were like, America you guys you're still like think your president is like a king and should be kingly or presidential yeah. as you say. He goes he goes in, in Argentina or they both did, they were like we don't respect our presidents. Yeah. He's in charge, but like we don't respect him as a human. Like it's just like if he's an asshole, he's call him an asshole. Right. Well, this uh, just it's the same thing as your boss at work. Yeah. You know, is we have boss, to lift right. them up. Yeah. yeah we don't I do like that them. that we just have a president that everyone just just shits fuck around. off. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like I get you're the one in charge of making rules, but fuck you. Yeah. You exactly. Know? I don't like you rules. You still be like you smell. Yeah. Yeah, I did a bit a long time ago for like a week. Didn't really work about if either Michelle Obama's or Barack Obama's. I think Michelle, if her what her dump smelled like, and people get so mad at me in the audience. And it's like, do you not think she takes dumps? Yeah. Or maybe it could have been Barack. I forget which one I used, but it was like this thing of like, stop. Like we want to put this guy or woman on a pedestal. Yeah. So like, stop not letting us. He was so funny and charismatic, though. Obama? Yeah. Yeah. It was like the first time that um, I feel like we had a funny president, at least that I was ever paying attention. I just, I liked that. I mean, I, you gotta look at Trump's stuff once in a while, and you're like, man, if he was on our side, we would laugh so hard at his stuff. Yeah. He made a campaign poster for Elizabeth Warren, and it said, uh, Warren, and then it's had the 2020, but it had one slash two, two. Like 2020th. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, if Elizabeth Warren was this conservative person and Trump was this liberal, you'd be like, that's hilarious. She yeah. lied about being an Indian. But you're just not allowed to laugh at him. But he's fucking, yeah, it'd be nice if he was an, like a normal dude. I loved laughing normal. at uh, Bushisms because that guy was such, a, was such a dipshit. It was mm-hmm. like my favorite thing, some like early 20s and uh, all the weird stuff he would say. He was so... Uh, I, well, I was high and paranoid, but yeah. uh, all the weird facial expressions he would make uh, not, not around the nine eleven stuff, yeah, where he would like say something really sad in a speech and then smile, and I was like, "This is—he's <laughs> obviously a reptilian." And now I'm like, "That guy might have social anxiety." Yeah, it could be like, that, right? I don't know what to do with my face you, right now. You start seeing people yeah. as actual real people, yeah, and you're like, "Oh yeah, yeah, I've been there before." There's so much stuff that I because I never had social anxiety till I got clean. I was very outgoing. Socializing was very easy for me before drugs. And then I think just like living in the underground for six years, I like lost the ability Mm -hmm. or came back and was so afraid. And um, now so many things that in my life I thought someone was being a bitch or someone was stuck up. I realize now like, oh, they're just socially anxious because it happens to me constantly now where I just want to be like, I'm sorry. I have two speeds. I can talk. And and you'll never get to leave because I don't know how to stop or I can just stand here and stare at my shoes. There's so much I realize now that like you can see it for yourself and then it takes you a second to see it for others where it's like, I'm sorry, my girlfriend just dumped me. So I was like out of it. Yep. But they're like, you're just a complete asshole. I said, how do you just walked away? And you're like, there could be so many things going on in someone's mind or or, or, that you're like, you just can't assume you know what people's behavior is. Yeah. You know, even misspeaks is like, if you're like, fuck him, and you're like, they're probably talking about somebody else. It's a, yeah. You just don't really know. Yep. We've been doing a lot of stuff on our podcast about... What's your podcast? Mormon and the Meth Head. You are the Meth Head. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was originally supposed to be comparing notes between... Because he was entering society when we became friends. And we were going to compare notes about entering society as someone who's leaving an oppressive religion. Uh-huh. And me re-entering society when i got clean from drugs but then after like one episode i was like well this is sucks not sustainable so yeah too. the first year after quitting an oppressive religion he's just like smoking pot for the first time trying all the drugs getting his dick sucked for the first time and i was like my first year was like getting my driver's license back that's <laughs> so much lamer this sucks because you already had your fun time yeah exactly and now you're dealing with responsibility parts yeah it's really interesting to watch somebody do things that I was just recklessly doing at 15, like someone deciding to do psychedelics for the first time and like Googling information about it, where I was like, I just took something from a guy in a playground 
<laughs> it really is crazy. The internet now, you can actually like do stuff. Yeah, well, when I decided to do Molly again for the first time in whatever, 20 years, I uh, was Googling it and learned all this stuff about the serotonin and shit. I must just make so much serotonin. But I oh, was yeah. eating tabs for days <laughs> for days i was just eating multiple i was dating a, an ecstasy dealer and we just had freezer bags of mitsubishis and shit like and i was just eating handfuls of them oh the mitsubishis i remember yeah, those yeah they were so great there must have been so little mdma in that shit because um granted meth would balance out any come down yeah but now i'm like what you should only do it once every three months and shit it's crazy i was not following any of those kind lines i'm Duncan lucky I'm told me he, he gave me ecstasy for the first time and uh it was just a pill and maybe a a, a a um dolphin or i forget what it was oh the dolphins yeah um and he was like feeling it because he was like flying and i was like yeah i think so um sort of like warm he goes you don't feel like no, no i do maybe i do i guess you don't it's okay but you don't <laughs> and I kept wanting to feel, you know, it's like before you felt love. And you're like, yeah, oh, I, yeah. I get it. Really into somebody. <laughs> and then he gave me another half pill. And then I was like, okay. He was like, yeah, you should have another half. And he's really good at dosing people. He doesn't like, he's part of my school of thought. We're like, don't try to fuck somebody up. Yeah. Try to get them where they sh- want to go. Yeah. And tell them where they should go and then get them there. Um, I feel kind of warm. No, yeah. And then I, the other half pill, I was like, okay. I was like, oh, yeah, man, I get it. I get it. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Let's go dance. I was like, uh huh. <laughs> Um, how long ago was that? How old were you? I was I was like the Mormon kind of uh, attitude too. I was religious Jewish until beginning of college, Orthodox wow. Jewish. So then it's like I didn't do it. I smoked weed a couple times in college, and that was about it. Drank some. So I was twenty six, twenty seven, wow. and that was my first non weed drug. Uh, but anyway, I, the next day I saw him at the comedy show. I was like, Hey, dude, we got to do that again this weekend. He goes, Hey, calm down. Yeah. You got to calm down. Yeah, you can't do it every week. And I was like, Why? Why though? Yeah. It's so good. It's so um so we did Moon Rocks. I think January was the first time. I stayed clean forever, like for a really long time, even yeah. though I immediately suspected after meth that I wasn't an addict. After meth, what do you mean? I quit meth really kind of like, man, fuck it, I'll just stop now. Oh. After doing it every day for so like no five and a half years. Or you like I just, um, you know, like addicts, like people who they quit doing drugs and then they become a gambling addict or they quit doing that and then they have to have sex all the time. They just have, like, like, yeah, it's like a real addict. It's a disease, personality type, whatever, whatever the school of thought. Like, I don't have that. I, I did speed. I needed to do meth because otherwise I think I never would have forgiven my mom. Mm -hmm. Um, I came out of five and a half years of doing meth a better person than I went in and like healed. Like I went in there and healed my childhood trauma and came out ju- and I just quit. I just quit like out of boredom almost. Whoa. And, uh, I was fleeing a, a bad relationship. The pastor. No, this was like meth boyfriend. Oh. And, uh, it was like violent, but I, I had another violent, They just ring every buzzer. <laughs> it's like food. Yeah. Um, I had a, a couple violent meth relationships, but they were like. Hold on, maybe it is there. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so you start dating meth heads too? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I didn't associate with anyone that wasn't on drugs right. for like five and a half years. It really does. Drugs and Jesus, I guess, which also is a drug. Um, well, you live it, in like a black market society where everything, it was just, you had people that did like identity theft. You had people that did uh, bank robberies. You had people that did car theft, bike theft. And then it, then we all just had our own economy. Sorry, society, by the way. I feel bad. Um and I was, I knew how to cure most tweaker illnesses. And so like I had like natural cures for stuff. Well, the, the abscesses were a big thing. So the, the tobacco, there was a huge, everyone got MRSA at one point and no I way. had figured out what, ways. Mm-hmm. 
um, from prison, I guess. Like they would go in and out of county jail rather and then come out. And so they, I never got it, but a lot of people got it and I knew how to fix it. Um, uh, and then also I, I had this like alien thing going on. So I think I was very interesting to have around. I was awful for the cops to deal with because I could just be completely honest about what I thought. And so it was very irritating for police. So you could have, I did not believe in talking to cops. Like I was raised, you know, kind of around that stuff. And so my mom taught me young, don't talk to cops. And so I would never rat on anybody ever. And then was also just irritating for them to deal with and so the cops would pick me up and i would talk about how i was sent by the collective consciousness to awaken a bunch of people and they'd be like get the fuck out (laughs) and so uh people kept me around i like was given houses and cars and stuff i lived a great a relatively great tweaker life for most of it and at the end it just got stale i did lose all my teeth and i did lose uh a lot of my vision staring at the sun oh no what really Uh huh. i went to a phase where i felt like everything was a lie i was like er like everything we've been told our whole life was a lie which i think is how people i've heard you talk about the conspiracy theories stuff like people's leaning towards conspiracy theories and it's like but we have been lied to about stuff so it it does make sense the more you pay attention to it the easier it is to kind of like dip into that it's a question of like if like Oh, they've lied to us in the past, and then, and then the conspiracy theory people sometimes make a jump. I'm like, they're always lying. Everything's a lie. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's easy like, to get into that. Yeah, I've, like I've fallen into that. Could be a lie, but just because this guy's uncle was best friends in college with someone who later worked for Monsanto, yeah, does not mean it's all aligned to like. It's yeah. just like, yeah. There is a sensation of them versus us, but you can never put your finger on who them is. Right, right, right. And that was 9 11 where they were like, it was an inside job. And then they made the leap to Bush was the guy who planned it. Yeah. But there's no proof of that. Well, you can't form a sentence. Yeah. Yeah. I immediately thought that. But like at this point, I'm like, the reptilians are running the government. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, anyway, I was like, everything we've ever been told is a lie. I will push every boundary that I've ever been told. And so I went down a Pioneer Courthouse Square and stared at the sun for hours. Oh, my God. And um, from what I've been told, it is uh, still a miracle that I, because I, I just have blind spots. Like if you stare at that light for a second and look away and you can still see the light. Yeah. It's like that. Wow. Um, All the time. All the time. Stare to the sun for hours. Your whole body rejects it. Like your whole. Also, I just wish that there was a camera. Can I have the footage from the Truman show that I live in? Because I have done so much absolutely batshit things. Uh, So many insane. I carried a dead owl around for a couple weeks. (laughs) What a crazy animal to carry around at all. <laughs> it was huge, too. It was like this big. And a dead one. Oh, my God. I found it at a rest stop. Uh, we were driving up. This dude brought me to pick up 10 or 20 pounds of weed from Mexico. And then we're driving. How anybody brought me. I was like his uh, roommate. And by roommate, I mean I slept on his kitchen floor. And uh, he brought me with him. We're driving up. We stop at a rest stop. And I walk into the bathroom. When I come out on a bed pillow like a like a bedroom pillow on the ground is an owl there's just an owl in the middle of the night on a fucking pillow at a rest stop this is the kind of shit that happens all the time by the way when you're on meth you step into some alternate universe where weird shit happens constantly i think there are owls on pillows at all rest stops all the time but like you walk past it because you're not high enough to perceive it Whoa. so i'd already had like enough alien experiences to know the owls were relevant to me i won't say spirit animal because now beer, uh, basic bitches talk about that but it's something similar and so i i had a necklace that I wore around my neck that had an owl on it. It was significant to whatever the fuck I was. And so I, I bring this owl back because I'm now having a spiritual experience with this owl. And it was warm. And I was like, I don't know if it's even like alive. What? And it was big. It was two feet probably. And its talons were the size of my hands. Yeah, they're tougher than you think they are. Yeah, right? no, they're fucking. So I come walking back up to the car and I remember that. Tom just like squinting his eyes as I'm walking up because your brain is like you only have so many categories of reason and none of them are owl dead holder. owl. Yeah. And so when I walk up, he's like, "What the fuck is that?" And I was like, "It's an owl. It's dead. I think it's dead. It might be alive. I don't know. Do they hibernate? It's warm. Anyway, I have to bring it with me." And he was like, "You're not bringing 
a fucking maybe alive owl into my car right now, Jessa. We have 10 pounds, whatever it was, 10 or 20 pounds of weed in the car. And I was like, well, it's my spirit animal. So I need to bring it because I need to bring it back to life. Because at this point, I believe meth can reanimate things. Because it will bring you back from a uh, an overdose. Meth will. Mm-hmm. From an overdose of something else. Yeah, like GHB, people would like pass out at GHB at clubs. You could slide a shard underneath their because uh, it's like adrenaline rush. Slide a shard, what? A shard of meth because it's like in long crystals sometimes, and so you slide that underneath someone's tongue, and they would wake up. These are uh, also, once again, not verified. These yeah. are tweaker theories. So also doesn't bring owls back, but I tried. So I put the <laughs> owl in the suit, in the in the pillowcase. I was like, this will fix it. And yeah. so I put it in the back seat, and then we're driving, and every time we hit a bump or there's a noise, he's just like turning around looking. How he let me bring this fucking owl. So we take the owl to a guy's house who's just a pothead, just yeah. a just a 40-year-old pothead who sells weeds to his friends and is forced to deal with tweakers because he wants to buy pounds of weed. And when you want to, you have to deal with actual criminals and actual addicts if you want to deal at that level. And so it's like late, it's late, it's dark. We're in his man cave in the garage and it's three couches and like a, a horseshoe. And the guy smokes a little bit of weed and then is annoyed that we're smoking meth. Like you can tell by his body language, he's um, uncomfortable, but we need to smoke. And then as soon as I get high, I'm like, I have to go get the owl. And Tom's like, do not. He's counting the money. He's like, do not go get that fucking owl right now. that right now. And this guy is just like looking back and forth between us. Also, no categories of reason for this owl conversation. And it's like, what? What is she talking about a real, what does she mean owl? And then we're arguing. I win because I have the keys. I go get the owl. And then I bring the, so then I'm walking back in with this pillowcase. There's an owl towel hanging out of the top of it. I would pay money to find this guy and hear his version of this story. I pull the owl out. I smoke some meth. And then I start shotgunning meth smoke into the owl's beak. Okay. That's, I mean, separate from what you're actually doing. Yeah. The methodology, I don't have a problem with. Okay, good, good. Yeah, because it totally made sense to me because the owl is still warm. And so I'm like, all he needs is like an adrenaline shot like Pulp Fiction into the chest, right? So then I'm like feeling around under the feathers for where to do the compressions. And this dude, this piehead who's probably got too high to deal with this right now, like he can't even, he's just staring at me. And Tom is just counting the money and like cussing me out under his breath. And every time I would blow the smoke into its little beak, its eyes would open up like a Furby and smoke would come out of the eyes. Uh-huh. I would think it was working. What? Thank God it didn't work. So I would have got my fucking <sighs> tongue bit off. And um, anyway, it didn't work. And then I just put him back in the pillowcase and was like, it's, we're close though. We're close. I could tell we're close. And this guy's just like, what the fuck? <laughs> Yeah, owls are not like that uh, Tootsie Pop Mm-mm. character. No, they're not they're nice. Wise and friendly. He never died. Like he never got gross. I'm assuming it's a he. Uh, sure, they're professors. Women can't be professors. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gender doesn't exist anyway. The alien said. Um, I for like two weeks, I I blew smoke into this. Uh, I like embalmed it really? in meth you kept smoke. Doing it? Yeah. And then finally, and this pissed me off so bad. You go, I finally, you woke up. <laughs> like what? I just was convinced because it just felt close. It just felt like we were close. And um, after a while, I think it just became habit. Just I associated exhaling with uh, the owl's beak, and then Ugh. I left him with Tom. And Tom told me that an owl shaman came by and needed uh, the owl, and I was. I felt That's for that. Lot. That was like some buzzwords, you know? And lot. so uh, it wasn't until recently when I, because I had forgotten the story. And then recently when someone brought it up, I was like, oh, he definitely threw that owl in a dumpster. Yeah. And I can't believe I had no questions. Owl shaman. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. okay. Like, I want to test this theory that we're not supposed to stare at the sun, but an owl shaman stopped by and needed a dead owl. I love <laughs> if you know that guy now, you could ask him. He'd be like, yeah, yeah, for sure. I threw it out. Like, I'll give you the truth. Oh, I bet I can find him. Luis Gomez, you know him? Uh, I know who he is. He he uh, called this drug dealer he used to have with, when he was living with an old girlfriend a long time ago. 
uh, on a podcast and he was like, listen, I'm not mad. It's okay. It's a long time ago. I've had five girlfriends since then, but I've always had this suspicion, did, but it's okay. But did you fuck my girlfriend? <laughs> he was like, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and he goes, really? He goes, yeah. I mean, yeah, you weren't there. She was like mad at you or something. He goes, yeah, yeah. She's, she, I think to get back at me, she did that. And he goes, did you run my bed? He goes, yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's a great podcast concept. Brian wants me to track down. Uh, I got molested by my friend's dad yeah. and told told on him. And then the teacher, my fourth grade teacher, just took notes for a year. Would just like have me come in and give a weekly digest of, of my the weekly molestation? molestation and never did anything. Whoa. And Brian wants me to like make it a podcast segment where I just track her down. I'm like, the she has to be dead. Yeah. And just be like, what the fuck? Yeah. The molester... I had this weird understanding of molesters where it's like you got this desire that you didn't ask for, you know? Yeah. So everything comes out of that. Yeah. It's not like an evil decision. Like, I'm going to fuck this guy over right, right now by, by raping this kid. Yeah. It's just like, I, I can't not, you know? But the teacher, it's like, yeah. I don't understand that. What is your fucking angle, lady? Yeah. You had nothing to gain. Just call the cops. And it was like, I didn't even know, I knew I didn't like what he was doing, but he was so good. Like I was the perfect candidate because my mom was an addict. I didn't feel safe talking Ooh, to my the parents. Molester, yeah, yeah. And he was like a pastor. He was like, not a pastor, but something big at his church. And he was my best friend's dad. And so I wasn't going to tell on him and he, everything he did had such an explanation that I... I was just like, oh, I don't like the way this feels. But then he would like shame me when I would try to get off his lap or whatever. And so um, he was really good at what he did. And then we had to watch one of those like videos in school where they're like, this is inappropriate touch or whatever they called it back then. And I was like, oh, that's happening to me. He's (laughs) not supposed to have his fingers. Okay. So, hey, he finger you. He blasted Mm -hmm. away. Whoa. And so I was like, but it was always like a one time he was like yelling at me for uh, coming in in a wet romper. That was the first time. It was like uh, the week I met his daughter. It was like I came in wearing a wet romper and he's like yelling at me while he's drying me off and then just doing that while he's drying me off. But I didn't even fully understand my anatomy yet. So I was like, oh, it gave me a stomach ache, but I didn't understand what was happening. But he's like chastising me for like being gross and not wearing panties and wearing this romper instead of a swimsuit. And so I was just like all this shame. And then another time he must have poured water on me and told me I peed myself in the middle of the night and made me take like this very shallow, weird bath. So all these things were like a good setup to trick a kid into thinking this was normal. But They're then, so trickable. Yeah. They're dumb. Yeah. Dumbass little kids. Then we watched this video and I'm like, oh, I recognize this. And so then when I went to her afterwards, it was just like, okay, cool. Yeah, so this is happening. So-and-so's dad is definitely doing all of this. And every morning I have to sit on his lap and he grinds into me. And I didn't know what that was yet. I didn't understand that he had a dick yet, you know? Yeah. And so... How old? Fourth grade? Yeah, fourth grade into fifth grade, I switched classes. And the bitch is still like pulling me in and asking me questions. And never fucking did anything. So then when I tell someone else and the whole thing blows up... She yells at me like I fucked up her investigation or something. Like, we only needed him to finger you nine more times and we would have had him. <laughs> wow. Like, not only is she not, was it not over and she, like, didn't do anything. Like, yeah. It was still going on. Yeah. It was still like, happening. You can stop it we from moved happening. That's just... how it stopped. Wow. So I don't know if it was just the think... problem when I, is I, I was nuts by the time um, I had developed all of these, what I now understand to be symptoms of, like, uh, PTSD. In fourth which is, grade? Yeah. Oh, from that? Yeah. Like, uh. once I started getting molested, my behavior got really strange. And so, it, nobody believed, like, even when I told my parents and stuff, they were like, well, you were so weird. And I'm like, yeah, when did I get weird? You know, I was getting molested by my dad for three years, or by my friend's dad for three years. Not my dad. My dad's great. But he was across the country. So, I'm just with my mom who's on drugs and isn't, you know, not exactly the most attentive parent. She hated this dude. Yeah. It's also the 80s, which was just a weird – his wife ran down the street one day like bloody in the face from getting beaten by him. And everyone in the neighborhood, like that was just considered a domestic – like right, where you would like, a couple fighting. Yeah, like come then. on in. Let's get you clean up get some coffee and you can yeah. get home tonight. And it's like yeah. now we're like, no, don't ever go home. Yeah. No, we didn't get – that was an abuse. Like people didn't talk like that. That was just like that's their private marriage business. And then I was allowed to go back to his house. It ain't like that now. 
Yeah. Your wife even shows some symptoms of narcissistic abuse and my kids aren't allowed at your fucking house, you right. know? But it was just, it was the eighties. It was the wild west. And so, um, but yeah, Brian's like, that should be a, a segment on your podcast. Just try to track that lady down. She yeah. has to have, she has to be 80. Well, I mean, I would love to know the angle. I've because I'm pretty good at putting myself in other people's if it was, shoes. She didn't believe you because you're like act up. What, then it's like, all right, tell me about it. It's like, okay, thanks, we're done. Yeah, then like let me chase you down to tell you, but you were like keeping me after class. The only thing I could think is she's either friends with him or a maybe, pervert maybe herself. That, oh yeah, maybe she's taking notes for like her. Mm-hmm. Own. I did even because I look, I was so adult already by nine years old that I did. There was other kids it was happening to. So I did even like I understood that I had uh, poor credibility because of who I was and how I was. And so I got another kid and was like, here's so and so. Uh, I know that she's better standing in society. Uh, what about her? And then when I finally was forced to tell my mom because I had told I had said something to the daughter and it blew up into this big thing full of people that I knew were getting abused. I, 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 I watched him do stuff to his kid. I heard him rape his wife. I saw his wife's bloody face. Like we're all getting fucked over by this dude. And when I finally tried to like stage a coup amongst his other victims, everyone was like, we don't know what you're talking about. Really? And yeah, it, the victims in his household. Yeah. Wow. And so other kids like outside of the household, we all knew that we were all, get, everyone was getting molested by this dude. And so, um, then when I was forced to tell my mom, um, my mom was like, I sell drugs. He knows I sell drugs. He's like a, like a pastor or some, whatever the fuck at that church. Um, nobody's going to believe us. And wow. I remember being at like nine being like, yeah, we should move. Wow. Like, I, that's the only option. I understood that already that the police were going to, just make it hard for me and my mom and, and not do anything. And I was right. (laughs) Fuck. Um, how'd your mom get clean? I got, I got saved and into Christianity and the, the pastor that was, um, whose kid I married was, he was great. He was fucking fantastic. And so he did like, uh, like a Christian recovery thing. And so my mom got involved in that and she got clean that way. I think when my daughter was like six months old, cause I, she was babysitting and I came over and, and some tweaker was holding my kid and I freaked out and it was like, she already wanted to get her life together. And so she got clean. She's got like 20 something years program. Mm-hmm. No, she never did the program. She did the Christian thing for a while, and then and then just quit. And now she, um, uh, she has RA. What does that mean? Rheumatoid arthritis. Oh. And recently started smoking pot to help with that. Does that help? I'm gonna get that from this fucking. Hand it does. Yeah. What is this? this? I'm fucking. They had to put a pin in my arm. Ooh. And another break, and the doctor was like, "Yeah, for, you're gonna get arthritis." I'm like what? What if? He goes, "There's no what if. You're getting it." Yeah, all the medicines did nothing compared to just smoking to weed. weed. Yeah, well, I got that covered. Um, so your scene, your social meth scene, like it was all just meth heads. Yeah, or drug addicts or whatever. Yeah, and it's just, it was just like time doesn't exist when yeah. you're on meth, so it's just a twenty four hour clock. So, uh, and then it was probably 50 altogether. If I counted everyone, if I could remember everyone, it was maybe a hundred from the beginning to the end of people just intermingling with each other. What do you and mean? So, just hanging out and fucking. Yeah. There was just however many houses at, at a given time yeah. and uh, different people coupling up and different people working together and fighting with each other and telling on each other. And, and, um, but it was, the identity theft stuff was brand new and it's find a way to score money so you could score yeah okay yep and then you have the dealers and then you have the cooks you have the people that cook the meth which this is all probably way different now uh because i think the meth all just comes from mexico, mexico. maybe yeah did what it was uh when you see like breaking bad so like um when uh when um whiplash came out you see that movie I don't think so. It's about jazz, some jazz contest. Was mm. it Whiplash? Was that what it was called? Anyway, my friend Anya was like, uh, her dad didn't like because he's a jazz musician. Yeah. And and uh, and he was like, 
there's no jazz competitions. That's not a real thing. So we hated the movie. Yeah. All the emotional arcs, everything, because the fucking setup was. And that's why I'm with stand up movies and stuff. Yeah. I'm like, that's. They don't have lockers. Like, what? And so then I'm like, I can't see any of it. So I won't watch any of those stand up movies for like uh, the. Well, Jed Abbott's problems editing, but that's another reason. But like, um, <laughs> yeah, it just bothers me. So like, when you see Breaking Bad, like, what were you like? No way. Um, I drove uh, my husband nuts during that because I met him in that lifestyle and then we got together after we got clean and so I just kept asking him questions like that wouldn't happen right that's not right that wouldn't happen but I think probably a lot of it was pretty close I do think I thought that all the time like someone who actually understands chemistry who's not doing meth that's the problem is that most people in that industry are hooked on it and that's why they're in that industry and so it's a lot more sloppy but all the jesse pinkman shit where he just fucks everything off because he's an active addict that was all very accurate nothing else matters and yeah um ends up hooking up with a girl that gets them fucked over and all that's all yeah all just a ton of like drug drama self-sabotage that's cool um the the actual cooking of the meth was different than anything I'd ever seen, but that was the premise of the show is that right. he figured out a recipe. That's at least why they justified it. Like, yeah. this is an abnormal way to do it. Yeah. So you're like, okay. Yeah. Wait, um, how do you, how do you fall? Oh, I'm sorry. I keep going. There was a movie called Spun. Did you ever, have you ever seen that? I remember it, but I didn't see it. That was damn accurate. Really? That was like, a tweaker definitely made that movie. Yeah. There's just a scene of a person that can't get off the toilet because they can't shit for like half the movie. You get constipated? <laughs> uh, I am anyway, but yeah, uh, uh-huh. that's an issue for a lot of people on meth. Because you're like not eating or drinking water, so nothing's going to work right. Your digestive system's not going to function. I love the post-drug night or alcohol night shits yeah. where it's either like can't or like everything's coming out. Yeah. I never had that. I have like some... Um, huge digestive issues i can't eat like i can't eat hard there's like three foods i can eat oh. nothing works how do you fall in love how do you like shack up with a dude when you're on meth every day it, it just you fall into these same cycles of life but you just live together instantly so my one boyfriend who was my boyfriend for like three years um, at this point, I believed myself to be Osiris, and I knew that Isis was coming that month because uh, I got a message from the front of a magazine, and a dude came to sell me some drugs from my friend, and we were arguing over the price. He was very obstinate and annoying, which I'm attracted to obstinate men. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, why do I feel this way right now? And he slid his sunglasses. To- or no, he didn't. He, he uh, said, I know who you are. And I'm like you. Ever since I was young, I could uh, tell these beings what to do for me. And then I was like, take your sunglasses off. And he slid his sunglasses down. And I looked down at the magazine. And he had the same eyes as the ISIS in that magazine. And it was I knew ISIS was coming in July. And it was July 31st. And I was like, you're my boyfriend. You live here now. Whoa. And then he was my boyfriend for three years. Wow. It was a very toxic relationship. He beat on you? <laughs> He was 5'6". He looked exactly like Tom Cruise and was the same size. <laughs> and so I took him half the time, so I yeah. felt like it was a fair match. See, I like that. I like that. I like uh, abusive relationships where it's like they're both beating on each other. Yeah. Like you ever see those videos of those big, fat black women like beating on those skinny, either black or white guys? And it's like, oh, he's really got no shot at this. Yeah, no. I. It was a very fair fight. I never considered it abuse. I initiated it a lot, and yeah. I do – Um I think because of the life I've lived, I think I see a lot more nuance in uh, life than, you know, it's just not that black and white. So I I was not the victim and this was not bitch, where's my dinner or, you know what I mean? This was, I uh, come running at you with uh, a weapon and you close hang me and get me first. You know, I'm, I'm not the victim in that situation. I have, I'm a foot taller than you and um, definitely outweigh you. I remember freaking out on him so hard one time. My safe word in sex was ice cream. And I remember him just holding me down during a fight and being like, ice cream, bitch, ice cream, like trying to snap me out of it. The next boyfriend was scary, bigger than me, tougher than me, and violent. And like that, I um, understood the violence in the nature of the relationship, but like also understood that I didn't deserve that. And so that's why I moved away. 
that's how you break up. Just mm-hmm. take off. Uh, that is my breakup um, method. Method is to move across the country. I've done it multiple times. Do you ever try to find these guys? I know where all of them are. Uh, the the ISIS boyfriend killed himself. Oh, what um, on purpose? Mm-hmm. Shot himself in the mouth. Wow. In the like, oh, put okay. a gun in his mouth. Yeah. Um, the last time that I talked to him, like we had broken up. Do it if you're such a big man. Shoot yourself in the mouth if you're so fucking so powerful. Yeah, I just what? he. He lost himself on drugs and then got clean and never came back, which is something that they say about meth, which is not my experience at all. I just had a great time. Wait, he got clean and never came back? He got clean and was never happy again, which is what they say. Like, they're, like after long-term meth use, it takes a year to experience happiness again. Damn. And he he sunk into a misery, and then I, I treated – like, I don't feel guilty for many things in my life, but how I treated him at the end, I feel guilty for. And – uh, Why would you do? I just felt um, my relationship with love is all tied up with my childhood stuff, and I'm just learning this. I'm just learning that um, I have an attachment system and I have security systems in me, and if I perceive uh, abandonment, then I, um, I'm so desperately afraid of vulnerability and. Uh, loving someone and like giving myself that you feel like an enemy the second i fall in love with you you feel like an enemy and i don't about to abandon you yeah because it's like all this childhood shit that i that i dealt with but i'm also just was never one i'm like a survivor i'm just like get up and keep moving you know and so i'm not someone who was like out of touch with shit but i just didn't realize like how written into my code the shit that happened when i was a kid and this last like year has really been about working that stuff out but um i felt like he brought me to this place where i felt like i found my one other person and then abandoned me because he got addicted to a video game and i'm attracted to obstinate men i love that but then i would like i push and then they just get obstinate and then i felt abandoned and i didn't know any of this stuff about how i operate yet i did it's all subconscious and so then i was just it just turned into this toxic mess and uh because i felt abandoned by him i just was cruel to him i did i fucked other dudes in the other room and shit. oh what yeah. in the other room because he would like if he would like uh watch porn and jerk off that felt like such a rejection. This is sober, you? No, no, this okay. is all high. And then he'd be in there, and you'd be like, "Fuck this guy, I'm gonna fuck." Yeah, somebody. well, you don't want to fuck me, then fuck it. Wow. This is like he's just high, he's just jerking off to porn. You fucking bitch. I know, but the other room, that's like. No, I'm saying no. I'm saying I was the bitch. Like, oh, yeah, right, right, right. I was the monster in oh, that yeah. situation. Oh, you're saying from his point of view, it's like I'm high, whatever. Yeah, I just fuck. like I look back and I'm like, fucking, that dude probably just loved you and was obstinate, and you loved that about him. And then when you pushed him about playing fucking Diablo two, he just played it harder because he's obstinate and you love that. Yeah. And I was just young and high and and broken, and uh, so the relationship went bad. And then we still like were road dogs. We were inseparable still for like a year and a half after we stopped fucking and stuff and uh and then it it got ugly when we broke up i had a new boyfriend and he hit me uh, afterwards yeah he hit me over something dumb like i had his bike and he had to come get his bike we had like this brother and sister dynamic and he punched me in the chest and then that boyfriend saw and uh and beat him up in front of me and i didn't stop it it's the one thing i feel so guilty about Do you? Mm-hmm. why seems like it's a nice little revenge thing it just was our dynamic and uh i i i uh i tried to protect him i tried to send him away and then he tested the boundaries and now looking back i'm like he tested the boundaries because he loved me and missed me and was sad that i left with this guy sad that i had a new boyfriend like now i can like look back with compassion and see all of all of the shit you know this is just like drug drama Anyway, he got clean. He had like three years clean. We were talking on the phone and I I was like, God, you're miserable. And he said, do you remember how I told you that if I ever got sentenced to prison, I would kill myself and reincarnate, you know, because we believed that this was a video game. And I was like, yeah. And he said, I live in prison every day of my life. 
And I was like, you're a bummer, dude. You should go to like NA or something. And he was like, I've been clean for three years. And I was like, yeah, but like make a friend or something. Yeah. Go to therapy. And yeah. uh, I called back a month later to wish him happy birthday or a couple months, whatever. And he was dead. He'd killed himself like a week before his birthday. Whoa. That's tough. Yeah. That was a bummer. And then, yeah, I know, I know where the other ones are. I'm about like for everyone got out. Everyone got clean. They all did. Everyone got clean. There's like a couple people died. They like died in like shootings. Are there lifers who just stay in it until they're old? Yeah. We were this weird group of people that all started around the same time and were like high functioning. And, uh, you know, you have the lifers that are like multi- multiple generations deep and stuff. This was like a bunch of club kids that accidentally got hooked on meth. Oh, wow. Damn, that's fucking weird. Is that your kid? Grandkid? Uh, no. Oh, the ki- Oh, in the picture, yeah. I was yeah. like, no, he's not old enough to text. Um, yeah. It just seems like, what a fucking drug. That yeah. thing where they're like, like you lose your teeth and stuff? Is yeah, that I that? lost all my teeth. Are those fake teeth? Mm-hmm. Oh, really? These are dentures, and I'm actually, they have implants underneath because I glued my teeth in on Bert's podcast. Really? Uh, at the beginning of the podcast, I realized that they were loose, and so I was like, just give me a second. And I, like, leaned out of the frame and glued them in. Yeah. And then got contacted by a dentist, uh, this guy Brady Smith in Portland, who has a podcast where he gives away dental work. Oh. And so, so he's like, come to my podcast. Yeah. He's like, come do my podcast. So I come to his podcast and he's like, do you want implants? And I was like, fucking yeah. Uh, the problem with dentures, cause I got them at 27. Yeah. The problem with dentures is that once your teeth are out, your body absorbs the bone, the ridge where your teeth used to be. Uh-huh. And if you don't have the pressure of teeth in there, it just absorbs it. So by having gotten dentures in my twenties, my face will start to sink in and I won't even have anything to put dentures on by my eighties. So implants is something I already wanted, but it's 20,000 fucking dollars no or way. Something. just to get what I got is four on top, four on the bottom. And then there's a thing that got made, uh, also donated all, I got all of this for free. Nice. Um, Fans that cool. clicks in and has like porcelain teeth and will stick in rather than glued in dentures. I'm for sure going to get them. I realized I was like, my tooth was hurting. I was eating popcorn. Yep. And I was like, I haven't been to the dentist in like 10 years. Like for sure. I have like 20 cavities. Uh, I have a bit about just get your teeth pulled because they're such bullshit. Teeth are awful. Like they were awful before drugs, but just get them. Just put them all pulled and get put dentures fake in. ones in. Yeah. Better ones. Dentures were great. That like now that I'm gonna have implants, I'm like, well, implants are really great. But Cause they'll feel teeth like are teeth. awful. Teeth a toothache? Fuck, have you ever had just a toothache? Toothache does suck. It's, it's like, a nightmare. What is that? It's like in me somewhere. Yeah, it's next that? to your it's brain. Like, you can't ignore it. Yeah. Damn. Would you ever try meth again now or is it no. too scary? No. What if everybody was doing it and they were all cool people? No. I won't even be in a house with someone that's tweaking. So I do not believe myself to be an addict. I do not. I believe that the, 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 like I quit cause I was like, man. And then I, I went into recovery. I did the program and the whole time I was in the program, I was like, I don't really resonate with this like Bottom. desperation or whatever. Yeah. I definitely hit went. I was drinking piss. I mean, I would definitely like went to the depths, but never against my will. I was just like, I'm someone that's here to experience everything life has to offer. Yeah. And I did that. I did it. It ran its course. And now I'm a domesticated housewife and now I'm something else, you know? But, um, so for a long time I was just like, yeah, but like, what's it going to hurt? Am I going to get too sober? And then after years, I was like, I don't drink because I don't like alcohol. Like, it's a downer. I don't like downers. I don't smoke pot because after I had my first kid, it made me paranoid and, like, self-conscious. And uh, that's just why I don't do those things. If I had the desire to do those things, I would do them. Um, I don't like saying that I can't do it because that's not true. I don't really believe that. And so after like seven years, but I did miss psychedelics. I feel like psychedelics are a spiritual and psychological tool. Yeah. Um, and I liked them for that. They really are a different kind of drug than all that shit. It is so different. I don't think that someone with the disease of addiction should do those. But I also, I like it. It it was this huge process to come to a point where I was like, that's not my identity anymore. And then to let myself like off the leash and I sort of don't think 
people who have addiction should do like mushrooms or something, but another part of me is like, but actually maybe it's fine. It just depends on I'm the person. I'm not willing to take the risk for your whole life. Yeah, you know, that's but- why I don't. It, for a long time, especially once the the uh, meth piss story came out, and yeah. then all of a sudden now Good I'm thrown story. thrown back into recovery hero without anybody asking me because I said I that was 12 years ago and I have I've been clean since then. Yeah. Uh, so what do you feel like you're letting people down? I feel like I don't want to give. I don't want. I don't want to put on a facade and have people think that I'm in recovery when I'm not. By their definition, I also I'm sober by your average person's definition. Uh, doing psychedelics a few times a year is not what most people consider. You know, I don't even. I don't drink. I don't. You know. Um, but then I also didn't want to make some great case for psychedelics and be the reason that somebody relapses. True. And so I, it, on uh, our podcast especially, there came a point where the I Mormon felt like, the method. yeah, I felt like we had a ton of recovering addicts as listeners, and I felt like I have to come clean. Oh right. But it was this weird thing where, like, I don't mind, I don't give, like, I don't care about being judged for my own decisions. I already know that I'm fine, but I didn't. I my fear was compelling someone else to try something that that isn't in their best interest. So after that, this is not happening story. You felt like you were. Like a leader for sobriety? Like Gethard had this when after he did his, his depression special on HBO. Yeah. And then people are like, next one's going to be a depression too. He goes, no, no, no. That was just one time. I'm done with that now. Yeah. No, it is. Um, but they want him to be the spokesman for forever. Yeah. No, it was. I got a ton. I still daily get messages about it. Do you still, do you feel, do, does it make you feel like, yes, I am a sober person who should be leading? No, I liked what a lot of people said, which was that I destigmatized. Uh, oh, right. that I that I made them feel less ashamed uh, because everything I said was far more outlandish than shit that they had done and they felt ashamed and they also had hope because of the depths I am talking about and then now I have this great life and I'm mm-hmm. fine and so I like all that that's all fine but um, the assumption that I'm in recovery uh by the definition but then also i think that a lot of people need that program and so i didn't want to shit on that program by saying i didn't need it i did it for a long time and then was like i got what i needed from it which was a place to uh to feel comfortable socially while i reintegrated with society but there are people that need to go there for the rest of their life and then that's a thing where i sound like i don't need it but you need it you know so there was just like no good uh no good way to say it i felt like so i put out an episode called not an addict where i just uh which that is song a, case choice yeah thank you yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh that's the song about meth right or just heroin heroin oh, okay um heroin got all the good everything heroin yeah. got all the good movies got all the good music what's the good meth songs fucking nothing oh third eye blind did a lot of meth songs really mm-hmm. oh lift you up until you break it was all uh meth yeah Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I feel like people, they end up, well, one, the problem with the program, people say, is like their the failure rate is astronomical. And they blame it on the program, but it's like, no, it's just hard to quit drugs. It's hard to and quit drugs. You along as best you can. And people quit too soon. What so do you when mean? people ask me uh, for help for their loved one, I'm like, let them go finish. Stop dragging your kids to rehab. I know it's hard when it's heroin because they could die at any second. But quit dragging your kids to rehab. Quit having interventions. Quit trying to make people get clean before they're ready to get clean. Yeah, it has ready, to run its course. It. Yeah. And so I am so glad that I just did it till I was done and that my parents were addicts. They were in recovery by then, but they knew. And I knew they knew. And so I didn't ask for help until I was actually ready. And then that way they weren't pissing into the wind. It was just, uh, all right, now we're going to do this. And I, I did the work and had my life back together within a year. Do you ever go to an intervention? No. Those things have that same problem where you're like, their goal is to get this person to go like, you're right, I'm going to rehab. But like, it's going to take longer than that. It's kind of like the, you gotta they have to them. work, right? Because they still do They still them. do them, yeah. But uh, I think it's it's a certain kind of person in a certain kind of situation. I feel like for the most part, um, for the most part, you have to figure it out on your own. You can't want to do it for somebody else. You right. know, that's all like cliche, but it's the facts. Yeah, I saw my kids say, you know, I'm trying meth because of you, Dad. It's like, oh, no. Yeah. Stop. I'm done. 
That yeah. Was the last time I didn't I give a fuck her. about any of that. I left my daughter with another family and didn't see her. Really? Yeah, there was a lot of other stuff wrapped up in that. I think oh, yeah, I was, you had that kid while you were a meth head. I had a kid when I was, she was four or five when I started using, and like I was raised in that and resented that I was raised in that. And so uh, she was already staying with my ex-husband's sister while I was on the road because he was fucking useless. And um, I, I, I envied that family because the mother was such a good mother. Mm-hmm. She was like born to be a mom and I never learned attachment and so I was such a bad mom I like I was like a person doing an impression of affection and this is something I'm just fixing at at, at this point in my life I don't know how to hug people I don't know how to uh like like uh, attach to people uh, I spent a lot of time worrying about when people die, I'm going to have to cry at their funeral or everyone's going to think I'm a monster. Like (laughs) I, uh, and so with my first daughter, I was just a kid and I just had, I didn't bond. I didn't attach with her. So I like, she looked great. You know, she looked great. I bought her the best food. I, I, she was in like child, uh, development stuff. And like, I taught her all these things early, but I didn't nurture and like show her affection and attach to her. And I would look at other moms and how they were so obsessed with their kids. And I was just like doing an impression of that. And I would would constantly think about, yeah, I was just like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I learned while that there was so much shit from my childhood that like I needed to work through and that I couldn't love her while I, I couldn't love anyone until I, uh, fixed this shit. And so I, um, I left her with that family and I was almost relieved to have gotten hooked on drugs to have an excuse to leave her with a family because I thought she was going to be so much better off. Whoa, not really? with me. Yeah. I felt Damn. like unworthy of being someone's mom. That's sad. It was very sad. <laughs> oh. And I got her back when she was 14 and it was really, she's fucking amazing. Was she mad at you? Was she like, who the fuck are you? I barely even know you. No, she found me on I got clean when she was 10. I contacted them. They were like, she doesn't want to talk to you. By then they were mad at me because I was supposed to have like stayed in her life and I just disappeared. But I felt like she'll be better off if I just disappear. Maybe she'll forget about me. I hated myself, obviously. And then when I got clean, all of a sudden now I'm uh, healed. And now all of a sudden I feel that weight of having a child and missing the child and everything. I didn't, I, I didn't feel that the whole time I was high. And, um, but I respected the fact that I may never get to see her again, you know, and if that was what was best for her, then that's okay. And so, um, then she found me on MySpace, and MySpace used to have that person I'd like to meet line. Uh huh. And mine just said Nicole, which is her name. And she saw it when she found you. She it. saw it. I think the mom that was raising her showed it to her. And, uh, she wrote me and said, I see that you'd like to meet me, but why did you leave me? And I was like, valid question. Yeah. And I was like, I was hooked on drugs and I was raised by a drug addict and I didn't want you to get molested and taken. You know, I didn't say that. I was like, I horrible things happen to me as a result and I didn't want them to happen to you. And I should have picked you over drugs, but that's not the way it worked out. If I were her, when I finally took you back to my life, I'd be like, you owe me nine years of presents. First of all, that's not yeah. negotiable. <laughs> it's non negotiable. We can work I would on like the rest. a Barbie. Yeah. I would like <laughs> updated. <laughs> So I got her as a teenager, which felt like karma. And uh, she is so much like me. Our personalities are so similar, which is an interesting study in nature versus nurture. Um, And uh, it was great. It was really the it was the perfect combination of things because I was really cut out to parent teenagers. I'm born to parent teenagers. Zero through 15. It's like they're not even you can't even talk. Yeah. They're garbage things then. Yeah. And she needed and you that. Her, you got her at the right time. She was curious about the world because they were Christians. And so she was curious about the world in a way that they, because she has me, my blood coursing through her veins. And so I don't think that they were, she needed the street education that I was going to give her. So she was this very sheltered homeschooled kid. And then I gave her this kind of realistic sex and drugs and, and, um, she went through a short rave phase, but other than that, she's got a great head on her. Sh- on what kind her of drugs she do now? She smokes pot. I think she's a mom. She's oh yeah, uh, hell of mom out. Ecstasy during rave phases, I'm sure. Yeah, and um, not. yeah, she she was in and out of that phase pretty quick, and rave. she's fantastic. She had the big wide pants. 
No. Was She's that young. what we that were in college? That was just us. That yeah, was just yeah, us, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they these kids wear, like, underwear to raves. They oh. wear, like, underwears and tutus. I'm, like, fucking so glad that I was in the other phase because I don't have the body type That's how you that get shit. into that nightclub in Berlin. They're, like, if you yeah. dress, like, with, like, leather straps with no shirt underneath it, it's, like, sure, yeah, you can yeah. come in. And yep. if you're dressed normal, like, 50-50. Yep. We don't know. Oh. Yeah. Um, all right, we can wrap it up. Um, wow, that's interesting. It makes me sort of want to do meth. Can you drop meth yeah, in a drink? Yeah, I feel like can you uh, someone I'm meth? selling meth on this. Yeah, uh, sure. No. So the thing is, is it's extremely addictive. Yeah. And that uh, I don't recommend it. Also, nobody else had as good of a time as I did. Right. So everyone else's life was a shambles. And I needed that. I needed to leave society. And I was also having that alien experience, which made it a lot more fun for me. You still talk to the aliens? Um, like I can on psychedelics and then uh-huh. who knows, it could just be psychedelics. It does just kind of seem like a video game though. If you look at it through that lens, what percentage of you, I'm not going to say, is it real? Is it not? What percentage of you thinks that aliens are real? What percentage is like, nah, no way. Um, so I don't, I don't lean into anything being, I have just kind of come to the conclusion that whatever you decide is real is real, right? Mm, okay. Because even Christians or even whatever religion, they live their entire life through that lens. And so for them, that's real. True. And I don't really need a bunch of other people to verify, like we need our reality confirmed by other people. I don't, I do kind of live my life like it's a video game that I am creating and um because that's what they said is that there is no good or bad right or wrong and that you there's like a rpg version of you and a first person shooter version of you (laughs) and the rpg version of you creates everything everything bad that ever happened to you the rpg version of you allowed it because in a video game if you're playing grand theft auto and your arm gets blown off or whatever fucking game allows your arm to get blown off you don't care because it's not real and so it's the same principle is that nothing is actually real. All those things that you're feeling like that's the thrill of the game mm-hmm. and that nothing has ever happened to you against your RPG will and that you can integrate those two things, which in like, uh, you know, which Eastern RPG? philosophies, when you, see the, when you see the man RPG is when you're like up in the sky and can see the whole right, game right. and then you play it out. It's not as exciting. The first, you just see your hands. First person shooting. shooter. You're just like out the eyes. Yeah. And so that would be life lived through the ego versus life lived uh, via your higher self. Oh. And so, uh, they say you can integrate those two things and control the entire game. And so I do, when something bad happens to me, I never take a white, like a victim thing on it. I'm like, okay, well, this is ultimately in my best interest. What would the purpose of this be? Yeah. And I found no harm in living my life like that because I think ultimately it's a life philosophy that, um, just live the game, play the game. Yeah. Just play the game. So I live it like that. I do. I do live my life like it's a video game. I, I look at things like that. It's fun. It's more like to me, I'm disillusioned with this. What the fuck are we here for otherwise? When I was in yeshiva and seminary, it was, uh, it was um, we, the issue of free will came up and how there's no time to God. God has no concept of time. Yeah. Everything's happening at the same time always, you know? Yeah. Um, Moses and, and, and us right here, it's all just, it's all in his brain, sort yeah. of, you know? And so he knows what's going to happen. And so like, how can you have free will if he knows what choices you're going to make? Right. God knows what choice you're going to make. And then my rabbi explained it to me this way. He goes, if you go see Jurassic Park and you go with somebody who's already seen it, and then that person goes like, ah, they're about to get eaten. And then they get eaten. And then you go, why'd you make them do that? <laughs> He's like, no, I didn't. I just knew he was going to. But it wasn't, Oh, it wasn't, interesting. Yeah. I didn't make them. I've just seen yeah. this a bunch of times. I know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, why not just play the game? The weird thing about those, those simulation theories is that I've never heard it quite put yet. It's like, so how many people are in the simulation? Is it just the one person who's aware of it? And then if that's true, then the other people that like, if you're in the simulation, who am I? Like, am I, do I think I'm real or am I just doing the things that would look like a real person would do? I all the time think there's a thousand of us right on this whole planet because the amount of me running into people and other people knowing other people that I know from completely different lifestyles in different states. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, there's a thousand of us. A thousand and, in the simulation. And uh, the rest are, are facades. Fucking extras. Yeah. And now uh, I've been 
uh, getting into like reading about reality transurfing and stuff. And uh, now I'm like, okay, what if all of these different dimensions, people are playing different games at the same time? So we're all around each other, but we're all playing a game on a different frequency. Mm. So even though you're standing a foot away from me, we're never going to interact because you're not on that wavelength, uh, for lack of a better. Um, So everyone's everyone's playing a game but they're all playing different games and so we're around each other but we'll never interact we'll basically be extras in each other's um movies yeah i heard uh um come to my window what's her name oh um melissa etheridge yeah she thinks she's simulation and she'll during times of turbulence i don't know this i heard it from someone else during times of turbulence in, in a plane she'll reassure everybody she goes no no it's my simulation so you guys are all fine because I can't die. It's my simulation. Yeah. Which is like, <laughs> it would only be reassuring if you fully believe there. Yeah. Otherwise, you're like, now I'm going to die and this fucking crazy bitch is telling yeah. me something else. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, it does help with like fear of death having had that experience because I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure uh, Start you over. get to come back. Yeah. But then people are like, if no, my dad wouldn't have left if you could come back. And it's like, wouldn't yeah, have left? because yeah, when I talk to somebody and they're like, no, my dad died and he never would have died if it was a choice. And it's like, yeah, okay, well, you're talking from the place of attachment to this reality. Yeah, he's in I'm a new talking, game. Yeah. He's playing Super Mario Brothers yeah. now. And also, if your dad died under the premise of what the, the alien said, and I'm not saying it's real because yeah. I could just have a brain tumor and I'm also fine with that. Like, I don't yeah. need it to be... I don't need it to be real. I don't need anyone. It just, because it doesn't matter. Ultimately, I could believe in nothing. It just seems like a bummer. Um, This works and it fits because I want it to fit. Right. It's it's the premise through which I'm, I'm living life and it's more fun. But um, under the premise of this game, there is no right or wrong. There is no good or bad. Nothing bad. Me getting molested as a kid was a, was a part of just this experience and it's, it, and it's it's a game and right and wrong do not good and bad do not actually exist i'm not saying go fuck kids but from the premise of the person who suffered the the abuse um i wouldn't trade that experience because it made me who i am it it influences my uh art it influences my podcast it was also the first um i hate the word psychic but the first uh extra sensory perception gift i ever had is if you've been molested as a kid and a pervert comes within a hundred fucking feet of anyone that's ever been molested they're like that is uh what that guy's fucked up that's a chomo you can tell yeah i do that with fest music festivals on the way out i can tell who's on psychedelic drugs because you've had that experience yeah or when i'm on i'm especially yeah then I'm like, oh yeah, that guy for sure. And then so you can't tell all of them, but you the ones you can tell, you're sure. Yeah. So that is because now I could like some of the stuff that happened with the aliens is they would like give me messages for people, and mm-hmm. I would have to like walk up and hand them notes and be like, uh, uh, what your dad did to you when you were a kid and shit, like hardcore shit. And uh, the sensation, and I was right, and the sensation of hearing people's thoughts or whatever feels like subtext and feels like i've been there so i know so you ever like had something happen in your you ever been cheated on yeah and then talk to someone who's going through the process of getting just find out they're getting cheated on you're able to give them advice because you've been where they've been and you've been the next stage in the next stage so yeah like, yeah I know. so that's going. what like this like what people call psychic ability or whatever really is is just like you're tuned in because just the sensation that you've experienced everything oh, right and, and it's like, i came how'd you back know? it's like because i've been there and it plays out the same for all of us yeah so when i came back from that big blue ball of light i felt too like like because i like plugged into all human experience i came back out i had this although i've had a lot of life experience i came back with this kind of like esp that came from having plugged into the collective or whatever i just got really high yeah interesting yeah it's almost kind of like two where it's like if someone dies, they go to a new thing. It's kind of like, you know, those arcade games where you're shooting like zombies and, some, and someone yeah. else joins in because it's two people yeah. to play. And when they're out, you keep playing. Yeah. But it's like, so they're dead. But it's like, oh, they're, they're next door playing another yeah, game. Yeah, exactly. Because it doesn't Pac-Man. matter. Yeah. So if that is true, that's fucking awesome. And we are living way lame lives. Like imagine getting tricked into believing. So what they said the reptilians were. 
uh, I'm sure you've heard the reptilian conspiracy that sounds whack. Bit, yeah. Um, what they said is that there are like, we are all just gods walking around creating reality, but you're unconsciously creating it. So you're mostly just creating things you hate because you're paying it like the, the mechanism that creates the reality, not the secret. Cause it's dumb, but yeah. similar in that you, you have something in you that creates your reality, projects it out yeah. and then you experience it, but you don't know you're doing that. So you're mostly just creating shit you don't like. And then you get just certain people who are naturally good at creating things they like because they just unconsciously are focusing on on the right things. And so, but there are Which some... It's just like positivity and negativity in your life. Yeah, kind of. It's not it's even that because there's this weird thing where you have to acknowledge failure as a possibility. Otherwise, you will create it. But uh, it's this whole, um, this whole weird uh, technique... But um, then there are people here, the reptilians, they call them parasites, that don't create reality. And they're like the one percenters or whatever. So their trick for creating the best reality for themselves is to get all the unconscious gods on the planet to create their reality for them by feeding them information about how powerful they are and then getting the gods to complain about it. And by getting the gods to constantly complain about the one percent getting richer and how powerful the government is, they create it for them. And that the only way that you could actually stop that pendulum is to unplug from it and just cease to fucking pay any attention to it but good luck because people think they're doing something by fighting it but you're just creating yeah. it by oh yeah that's it. all those e-ragers i call them mm-hmm. like when people get mad at you for a tweet or for fucking stand-up stuff or whatever yeah and you want to like convince them but you're not going to convince them it's, yeah that's you can convince half a percent of them yeah and then you'll just tell a lot more people to yep. be mad yeah um yeah you just have to like exit there's no win the only win is leaving it's like yeah. it's like it's like if you're in a building with a fire you don't fight that fire. You just yep. leave the building. Yeah. The only, the number one rule of creating your reality from this premise is ignore everything you don't like. So if I take a hit, if I take a financial hit, uh, I used to, if I took one financial hit, would freak out so hard that I would just, like parking tickets would show up out of uh-huh. nowhere and, you know, oh. or like when you're late and you freak out about being late and then it just, everything in the world conspires to make you more late. You just have to unplug from it. Give it nothing. And be like, I just don't ignore care it. if I'm late or not. If you need to take action to fix it, take action but with no emotional because all of that that panic emotion you're yeah. you're creating things the thing with that is even if it doesn't get you somewhere on time you've made getting there on time not matter so who cares yeah it's almost like i want to get there at five past an hour yeah and then when you're flying from abu dhabi to here so it's like all right it could be five past one five past two it depends how long the plane is delayed and what traffic is like from jfk yeah but then if like i don't care if i get there five past an hour or not then like you just don't think about it. And yeah. may, you may or may not get there five past an hour, but like it doesn't give a shit either way. Yeah. So it's, it's just attachment to outcome fucks everything up. Yeah. Attachment Expectations. to outcome. Yeah. Which is what happens when like the secret came out and people were like, oh, I'm going to manifest my reality. All it did was t- you're making a bunch of fucking vision boards and attaching yourself to to outcomes. Yeah. When it's really a lot more. Lack of atta- attachment yeah, to outcomes. Lack, which is just in general, you'll be a happier person. You learn how to not attach to outcomes and just live yeah. your life. We saw this guy in Inlay Lake in, in Myanmar. We're, we're going north and we're waiting for the bus. And some guy's like, where's the bus? Where's the 12 o'clock bus? I'm like, oh, it doesn't go on Tuesdays. He goes, what do you mean? And he's just like screaming at yep. these people. He goes, I checked out of my place. <laughs> and they were like, I don't, I mean, there's no, there's no 12 o'clock bus on Tuesdays. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Left at 11. I was like, I can't just. And he just started screaming and they were just like kind of laughing. We were too. And it's like, this guy is still attached. Yep. And like reality is like, hey man, just get a hostel for another day. Yeah. Just take your stuff back. Get another hostel to be like, all right, well, when's the next one? Is it in three days? All right, then I'm here for three days. Yeah. And won't that be fun? Yep. Or is there another means of transportation? <laughs> but like you're still attached to this 12 o'clock bus thing and it's not happening. Yeah. No, and it, exactly. It's like uh, there's a sensation that if I throw a big enough fit, this will change. Uh-huh. And, and sometimes that works. And yeah, I mean, there is like, I am, it's, it's a, it's a weird blend of, I am someone that if there is an opportunity, I will bleed the opportunity. Like I will not stop. And I also like, I go after things, but if I, if I take a hit or what I perceive to be a hit, I immediately assume um, that it is in my best interest and that it is because then I can look back 
and be like, oh, okay, this failure, this perceived failure yeah. was actually just a step that I needed to get to this success. I yeah. just assume that failure or I assume that I if that was, my I, flight yeah. gets canceled, it's because it was going to crash or, you know, I just assume everything is always happening in my best interest. And I look at it that way and it's real easy for that to come into focus. And I just don't. Um, well, sometimes you do like, like I do that math where it's like, fuck, if I, if I, if I, hadn't missed that red light or had yep. been stopped by it then i wouldn't have gotten this par- speeding ticket you know yeah nothing crazy like death but like or if i had made that red light i would have been past this cop i wouldn't got the speeding ticket yeah but then you're like you could torture yourself or you're like or you would have crashed and died exactly like, or it's, lots of stuff could have happened yeah it's just not anymore because you missed the red light yep i don't do any like regret shit i just yeah. if money doesn't matter it's fake there's nothing real about it and the less the more like importance you put on it the more like it life matters. becomes about survival the 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 worse the flow so i was like that took a long time to like deprogram that poverty mentality for me oh yeah uh because i was raised poor but um yeah money's not money's just fake as fuck it really is just representative. The people who have a ton of it just realize that it's, it's nothing. It's complete made up bullshit. I see all my friends. I have successful friends, you know, and they're like still slaves to income. Yeah. And I'm like, well, what? How, you've made a bunch of money. They're like, yeah, but I'm making all this money. It's like, I know, but you have enough. Yeah. So just let's enjoy sit by the pool. it. You could fucking die tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I'm like, how much more do you need? I get if it's like I can only make a million dollars a show this month only. But then, yeah. yeah, do thirty-one shows then. Yeah, you know, and then yeah. get back to normal. But if it's just an ongoing thing, like wh- when are you gonna like have fun? Yeah, spend have fun. It. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. what's the point? It's so weird. All right, Jessa. This was great. Yeah, thank you very much for coming over. Sorry about your lift. Um, her podcast. I don't really remember them usually, but this is an easy one. The Mormon and the Method. <laughs> Is that what it's called? Mormon yep. Head? All right. Very nice. And uh, your story on This Not Happening last year was like the best one. Thank Maybe you. Maybe top two or three, actually, if I want to. Do you remember calling me before that? To go over it with you? Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember uh, you said, what is this area code? Uh, uh, Delaware? And I said, Delaware. And you said, you live in Delaware? And I said, yeah. And you said, why? <laughs> <laughs> and then I moved to LA. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it was just so weird because like, I was gone in, in Asia and Eric was like, contacted the people that i said contact and then yeah. some more people that he knows the type of people that we like you know yeah and then uh yes yeah, so i didn't really know you and then i was like talking to you about it yeah the one thing i was taking up was just calling you so i had to call all these people and like go over their stories with them yeah because too many times i just trusted people and they sometimes they didn't try yeah and other times they really just didn't understand the concept and so they actually needed me to like go over it with them yeah um so i was in the beginning i was like no nah, it's not for me to tell people what to do and then sometimes like no you don't tell them what to do, but you can give them a hand. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. how you doing? How's your ending? But uh, talking to you and the way you talk about working it and stuff. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay. No, no, you know what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're fine. When I found out that this was a show that existed. Yeah. I watched, I think it was two seasons in and I stayed up all night, watched it all night. And I was like, there's a, there's a, a fucking, a show for stories. Yeah. And I watched them all. Yeah. And then was like, I ha- like I have to get like finally a show. Everyone else want to do late night and shit. And I was like, I'm yeah, so not. Late. Yeah, gross. Plus, what am I going to do with any of those fans? You know? Right. And all I wanted to do and all I've ever done was dark stories. Like, I want to make people laugh at dark, sad shit. Yeah. And so I obsessed over it. But I was like, I don't know how I would ever get on it. And then you posted something on Facebook the day after I had done a storytelling show about my teenage marriage. And so a bunch of people tagged me in it. And then I sent him a couple videos, but I never record anything. And then I think I sent him a home birth and he wrote me back and was like, a what? This, a home birth? A story of my home birth. Uh-huh. And he was like, this doesn't work, but if you want to keep in touch for next year and within, I called people, asked them to put a show together so that I could do the story. I wrote the story, the first version the of the story. story. Yeah. yeah. And then like within a few days sent him that and he was like, yeah, it's like, we haven't even filmed this year. You're fine. You have time. You have a year. And then I was like, okay, so I sent him another version. He's like, okay, I guess we're doing this. And yeah. then I just was like, this is it. This is, I wanted to do this. I am not going to fuck this up. And I ran that all, that dark, I've never done it since, but this dark story at like VFWs, because I'm living in Delaware. There's no storytelling shows. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. I was um, obsessed, but had also watched by that point every single story that had ever been told on that show and read every YouTube comment. Oh, really? <laughs> and do you see the people go like fake or lame or whatever? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I was, this was like the this was like the thing I wanted to do. You could tell more. the ones, not everybody could tell, but at least I can tell sometimes where it's like there's a difference between like wow that's crazy i can't believe it versus yeah. like i don't believe it yeah this is you're not even setting this up to be a real thing yeah like you're a lot like if it was if it's easier to tell it's like and then i flew away you're like oh well i know people don't fly so that's yeah. definitely a lie but it's like on that level almost where i'm like nah so like then you see the ones that are like unbelievable but yeah. still like i'll More still believe unrealistic, it yep. yeah and you're like whoa um yeah, there was definitely you could also tell like people who were who were storytellers uh-huh. and people who were like, man, I can tell a story. I do comedy. How hard could it be? Yeah, and it's yeah, like, yeah. oh yeah, it's, it's an like, art form work that you it, didn't. Man. Yeah, yeah. People go like a lot of people like submitted and they were like, okay, it's not ready yet, but I can get it ready in like a few weeks. I'm like, okay, but here's the deal: not to insult you, but like some of my stories on here is taking me like three years to yeah, like, get down. So like, throw it together. So like, it's okay. You yeah. can take more time, but like, they take a while. Yeah, it's hard to figure out. Yeah. Yeah, it was... Um, yeah, I'm glad you did it. You crushed it. was me great. Me too. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I was looking for like chicks pretty much or anybody young. Yeah, that's what you said. Just anything but white dudes. Can we... Uh, well, was, I had enough white dudes. Yeah. I just needed yeah, some other... Yeah, we hit that quota. And it was like, I, I was, was quitting comedy. Look, I was also still looking for white dudes. Yeah, but, but there was that. But not as actively. Yeah. But if I saw a white dude with a great story, I'm like, oh yeah, that's awesome. I need to have Perfect, that. Perfect, yeah. I was so... Uh, yeah, it was crazy how it all lined up. I was about to quit comedy. Oh, really? I had said, like, if I don't make something happen in two years, uh, I will be done in the first email that I got from him. Because then I flailed out in his inbox because I'm um, a mess. Yeah. And so... Um, Did you know him from somewhere else? I had bombed or- in front of him at a festival. Bombed in front of him at a festival. Yeah. And then when I realized who he was, because I was like, why do I recognize his name? I was like, oh, okay. I was just going to pretend it wasn't me yeah. when I talked to him on the phone. And then I told him a like we talked for like an hour and then he was like and now you're like a mom and i was like oh god you remember me and he was like yeah we met in montana and i was like oh i was just gonna pretend like that wasn't me <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, oh, fuck. damn but you're one of the people that remembers things <laughs> <laughs> the cool thing about bombing is that you're forgettable so i thought maybe i would have gotten away with it but yeah no. what was the story called do you remember what they titled it meth p Meth B. Okay. Which I knew from all the ones I had clicked on and I looked at all the views and stuff. I was like, the name has to be, the name has to grab them. So every copy I sent to them was Meth Piss. Oh, really? Uh, trying to like sink that into their head that it should have this. Yeah, we had a big, sort not a fight, but one of the many butting heads I had with Comedy Central was like, let me and the comedians help name our own stories. And they're like, well, we think this tracks better. I'm like, well, one, a lot of these you've given away the ending. You can't do that. Yeah. You know. Well, that's what I was afraid that they would change the name because it was such a because the story goes on for a while before you get to that. Yeah, part. but it's not all the way through. Yeah, if yeah. it was like the very last punch sign, and it's like, and I was really your daughter. Yeah, <laughs> and, that, and story over. Like you can't put I was really her daughter. Yeah, but like yeah, you can do. But it definitely got a lot of clicks as a result of. Well, that yeah, anytime name, you put so. drugs in the title. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, but yeah, it's great. How many views does it have now? Two million. Two million. Something? That's crazy. What a fucking great fucking platform. Yeah, it's uh thank you very much. Yeah, I wish you're you welcome. would have been there. Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Shit went down, but I wish I could have been. I it was like apologize. the day I landed in LA. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I was still talking to you like two weeks before. Yeah. I was like, so we're ready, we're getting good. <laughs> yeah, well I was like I couldn't wait uh to work with you and then yeah. I was like I mean he was great, but I I felt um, that's what I felt bad about for a lot of people. I'm like, sorry I couldn't like be there for it. <laughs> I just felt bad for the yeah. comics. Mostly. Well, then when I saw Bert and he was like, we didn't do it because he didn't do it. And I was like, oh, now I feel like a dick. No, but there was a lot of people I talked to. They were like, can I still do it? I'm like, for sure. Especially yeah. some of my friends. I'm like, no, no, you need this TV credit. Yeah. But no, for, it changed my whole yeah, life. For like, Christian it changed Segura, everything. it's like, they're like, well, I don't want to do it. I'm like, oh, well, justify, like, I actually can't put myself in your shoes and tell you should do it. Yeah. You, sh- you should. Because, yeah. But for you, for sure. Ryan O'Neill, my buddy, was like, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I was almost like worried that they try to punish me. Because they did for other things, but like punish me by like canceling the ones that were like important to me. Yeah. But they didn't, so no problem. That's good. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, MFP, watch that. Go listen to your podcast, Mormon and the Method. <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever talk about docking or floating or whatever it's called? Soaking? Yeah, it's fake. Soaking? It's soaking fake. is fake? It's, it's basically just the tip. 
Yeah. Uh, it's like a, uh, an excuse that dudes use to date rape from what we've gotten. It's just like, well, just let days. me put it in there and not move it. But it's not a practice. We've heard of floating and uh, uh, jumping. This song is in place of a copyrighted song. This song is in place of a copyrighted song. Skeptic, 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 skeptic. I drove up to Banff. Me and Kathleen McGee drove up to Banff to go to a hot springs. Whew, it was nice. It's worth a drive. Hour and a half drive to go do fucking 40 minutes in a hot spring. It's worth it, though. Once you get into nature, it's all gold. Um, doesn't it make you want to do meth? Listening to that, I know it's supposed to not make you. They had this uh, problem I took in film class where they said there's never been an anti-war movie because any any anti-war movie glorifies war, so it's impossible to make it where it'll it, it's it's and, and they they showed in, enlistment goes up every time there's an anti-war movie, enlistment goes up, which is like you know counterintuitive, but it's cool. I mean, even look at look at like Saving Private Ryan, the coolest guy in there was a sniper. Agree or be wrong, but. Um, when he's sniping even when he gets shot when he gets blown up spoiler alert um, when he's sniping people before he gets shot you're like I want to be a sniper so it's impossible to make this anti-war movie because it glorifies the act of war and even hearing about how shitty your life got on meth makes me want to try meth I'm not gonna but at least for a little while at least for a little while. And my friend's writing me, well, give me other endings that I could live with. I said, here's what they're going to do in Game of Thrones. They're going to have a, uh, a, a, a musical dance number to end it. They're going so Hollywood, they're going to do a musical dance number. Have all the old characters come back out and really fucking <laughs> do a choreographed dance. That's how you fucking guys are portraying us. Well, honestly, that's now in the realm of possibility. Not probable, but it's possible now. Ugh. I mean, for real, ugh. <sighs> anyway, uh, my dates, I'll be in Cleveland this weekend the, um, th- at Hilarities. Go to ariethegreat.com for tickets. Uh, May 9th, 10th, and 11th, Omaha Funny Bone. May 17th and 18th, um, Columbus, Ohio. May 14th and 15th. No, no, not May. June, 14th and 15th. Uh, June 25th, I'll be in Cardiff, Wales. Really excited about that. Looking for a bunch of drugs to take with me to my next stop. Um, And I don't know how much I'm going to get. I'll probably be able to find weed and maybe Mandy, but I don't know how I'll be able to find mushrooms and acid. I need everything. Lots of it. I'm paying, by the way. Um, All right. And then that's it. And then I don't know. And then end of July... 31st is Indianapolis, and f- August 4th is uh, Milwaukee uh, at Turner. So that's it, right? Thank you, Justin Reed, very much for, for coming on and talk to me. Thank you, Blue Chew. If you go to bluechew.com and use the promo code ARI, um, free. Your first order is free, just $5 shipping. It's cheap as shit, you guys, and they put a shitload of them in the pack. It's not like they send you one pill. They send you, like, a bunch of pills. So you can – I would try one of the Blue Chew, see what that does to you if you've never done it. I mean the way Gomez talks about it, he's like, dude, I need a quarter of one. And it's fucking – it's like nothing you've ever seen before. But try one. If I ain't going to do anything to you, try a few more. Um, and be careful because it makes your tongue blue. So, you know, rinse your mouth out afterwards. Um, or just let her know. It's time for the opening – of the vagina bluechew.com promo code ari uh, so that's the episode you guys i hope you enjoyed it can you please let everybody know about this podcast if you know anybody in cleveland or in columbus um or in omaha uh let them know i'm gonna be there and tickets are at ari the as always oh fucking fuck i forgot to do this i gotta do a drop we are doing the very first show at the stand the new stand is opening up and it's the very very first show ever at the stand book now is this it nope uh, buy tickets. Here we go. Ari Shafir's renamed storytelling show presents Dawn of a New Era at the stand, May 23rd, 8 p.m. 
get tickets. $20 tickets. The lineup's going to be fucking sick. I'll tell you already now. It's going to be two of your favorites from this not happening. And um, two of the best. Two of the top top teners. This is not happening comics. Not Joey Diaz. Get it out of your mind. Um, yeah, it's all stories about newness or rebirth or spring. It's it's The stand is finally opening up. It's 116 East 16th Street. I'll have tickets um, on the website. You're definitely It's definitely going to sell out. So get tickets ahead of time. And then make it a fun night, you guys. This song is in place. Fuck Ars Shafir. He didn't pay for none of this goddamn music. Cheap ass fucking Jew. <laughs>